rebound by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Lillian able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani. Around the front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Perry in the fence. One one. Score! Off the floor. On the board. All Korea. Yeah, neither did I. <laughs> All right, we're live. <laughs> I think, I think, I think, uh, much to the chagrin of apparently every other fucking Ducks fan, um, mm-hmm. yes. I would say, like, I have a gigantic hole in my musical knowledge for metal. Oh, yeah, same. I like, like, again, and this is one of those things where it's like you say it out loud, and then people who are like actually into metal are like, you're the reason I hate things. <laughs> But it's like, as far as like Metal is concerned, like the Black album is fucking incredible. Like I've listened to the whole album a billion times, but that's because I found it like in my parents' record or like CD collection, yeah. which is almost just as antiquated at this point as record collection. Um, but like I found like my parents like I, I found the Black album and I listened to it all the time. Uh, and then you know I, I just but like like a little bit of Corn, a little bit of Slipknot, all that kind of new metal gross shit, which I fucking love. You can't make me not love it. Um, and then, like, I listened to Ramstein for, like, two years one time. Like, just randomly would listen to, like, Ramstein for no reason. But, like, as far as, like, actual metal's concerned, like, Megadeth and, uh, what do you call it, fucking Pantera and all that kind of shit. Like, no. fucking nothing, bro. Nothing. I don't like, have, I don't like have I any have... of that in my, <laughs> in my run. <laughs> it's one of, the one, one of the genres that escapes my playlist, so... I don't hate it. Yeah, like, like I just, I'm no, not a. Not. Uh, I I have it. I just can't find myself in a mood to sit down and listen to it. Where I'm like, yeah, this is this is the mood I'm in right now. I don't yeah, know. I think I think for me, like, I liked some punk and a lot of rap when I was in that part of my life, mm-hmm. where I was like, oh, we're listening to angry people music today. Hey, it, um, it fits uh, fits where the ducks are right now. Actually, I guess you know you know what. If you look at their record, you would say people would be angry, right? From the outside looking in, if you're not a ducks fan right now and you haven't watched the games, you would say that the vibe in the fan base should be that they're angry because they've started one four zero. It mm-hmm. doesn't feel like they've started one four zero. If you just <laughs> measure the fans' reaction right now, everybody's pretty excited and happy regardless of the results here i'll do you this i'll do you this troy terry one goal two assists not bad Mm -hmm. see trevor zegers zero goals one assist yep uh jamie drysdale has only played two games he's got two assists but he's only played two games yep uh basic mctavish i guess is the one you're looking at is the bright spot if you actually like go to even to the hockey reference, right, where you take the next step going from the standings to the stats, you yeah. still wouldn't see a lot that would leave you feeling all that inclined. Uh, Lucas Dostal has a 919 save percentage. Gibby has a 907. So, like, that's not bad at all. But, like, there's not a lot of information to lead you to believe that Ducks fans in general should be happy. But by and large, other than procedural things that people are unhappy with here and there, and the fact that the power play still sucks... Yeah. People are pretty stoked with where the team's at. Yeah, it, and there's been positives, right? Like, Leo Carlson scores yeah. in his debut. He's looked good in the two games that he's played. Um, yes, it's been two, right? Yeah, yeah, two games that he's played. Mm-hmm. Um, Trevor Zegers, despite one assist in five games, has looked good, and he's generated scoring chances. Fantastic. And, like, you can tell he wants <laughs> he wants that goal over the last couple of games. Like, eight shots against Boston, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, there was the, the one power play that they had where he had, like, four shots in a row on that one power play. So he wants it, and he's going to get going. McTavish has started really well. Vitrano, McTavish, and Strom as a line has been the Ducks' most productive line. But by far and large, the most exciting line has been Leo Carlson, Troy Terry, and Trevor Zegers when they've been on the ice together. Um, and even the rest of the guys, uh, you know, uh, the Bo Grew, no points, has looked pretty good. Max Jones has done well in a bottom six role. I, I like, you know, Leeson and Carrick and what they've done on the penalty mm-hmm. kill and, and what they've added to the lineup. Labushkin has actually been a pretty sneaky good at it. Like, that pairing of him and Minchikov has been 
defensively excellent, and then Labushkin has allowed Minchikov to get forward and do what he does best, and he's arguably been the Ducks' best defenseman. Um, I think when Luno's come in, he's looked good. The rest of the defense has been pretty solid. Gudis has maybe, you know, been a little shaky defensively, but he is coming from teams where the, he had a lot of support to being kind of the main guy there, so you can understand that. But, but by and large, like, they're, they're, there have been positives there. and the, You know, they lost to Vegas. That's understandable. Vegas started, what, 6-0. and They lost to Boston, who started 5-0. and um, they lost a tight game to Dallas, who was undefeated at the time, and I think they still might be undefeated and are you know, a cup contender. So Vegas, defending cup champs. Dallas Stars are a cup contender. Boston should be a cup contender, started undefeated. A tough loss on the road against Arizona. Those games are always tough between the Ducks and the Kings, right? Like It's always a tough matchup. I know Arizona is one of the worst teams in the league, but... Um, you know, it, it's it's a tough barn to go into and, and play well, and then a convincing win over the Hurricanes, who are a good team as well. So, like you know, the, there are chances to get points from these games. There are positives in each of them, and um, the the feeling around the fan base definitely doesn't feel like a team that started one and four and has to go back to Boston and go into Columbus and go into Philadelphia this weekend. There is optimism about these upcoming games. Just being able to see some more of what we've seen so far. Mm-hmm. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I think um, you know. I think it's 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 been a good good process so far. Like I think you can see what everybody is kind of supposed to be doing on this team. I think it's a little bit more clear. Um, you know, I, I don't because I well. Uh, uh, I think it's still too early to know how good of a head coach Greg Cronin is. Mm -hmm, There's just simply not enough information. He hasn't really faced any, like, actual, like, problem-solving, you know, moments or anything like that, which is going to come. It's inevitable. I'm not knocking him for it. I'm just saying it's still It's still too early. But... If nothing else, I think that you can see players seem to more clearly know what they're expected to do. Mm-hmm. And you can see what the – and to, in that same way, you can see the roles that guys are supposed to be filling on this team. Yep. And I think that in and of itself is all – and is an improvement over last year where at times players looked uncertain, overwhelmed, um, uh what do you call it? Kind of lost at times, you know. There were, you know, like you would see guys who were playing together all year look like they'd never met. You know what I yeah. mean? It was, it's, it's nice to see. I still don't think, you know, that there's enough there to say this is the guy for the next however long. Mm-hmm. But again, I do think it's fair to say that getting Eakins out of there and bringing in just someone new has had an immediate impact on how this team feels heading into the year. Yeah, there, there seems to be a bit more accountability. Um, there definitely. Seems... Okay, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What does that mean? I, what does that mean to you? I, I don't. I don't think I mean it on a, on a, the players were doing anything wrong side of things. Just from the notes that we've heard from practices where things aren't going the way that he likes it to go, there is a, a, a bit more of a you know less of a best friend vibe than what we got from Dallas Aikens, where it was kind of pulling guys aside one-on-one conversations and more of a lighting guys up and saying this isn't right we're doing it again until we get it right type atmosphere honestly i i i think that's something the team needs coming off a guy like dallas agents it's not saying mm-hmm. that dallas agents did anything wrong but i don't think you can go from a player's coach and somebody like dallas agents to another guy like that if you're trying to shake things up and i think what they're doing is trying to shake things up bringing in a completely different guy a bit more of a, a disciplined approach to his coaching style um it seems to have woken some guys up but again it's early it, it might mean nothing that might not be the result of his you know a, a disciplinary accountability type approach um to it i've just noticed that a little bit more that that he has that side to him, which we didn't really see from Dallas Aikens. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, it's going to sound like really distant all of a sudden because I think my headphones just died. So. 
lost. Yeah, we lost you on, on the video here. Yeah. They are not even appearing. All right, whatever. Uh, what's up? Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, no idea what happened. Sorry, everybody. It's all good. So, my, only only the only people the people. YouTube peoples get to see this, so <laughs> not the audio people it gets it gets cut short. <laughs> so we're yeah. good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. I just I've seen a lot of people talk about accountability, mm -hmm. and that it's not that this isn't what you should use or whatever, but it feels like. It's mostly been people repeating what the players are saying, which to an extent is all we have to go on. So you yeah. can only take that. But it also feels like early season. I'm in the best shape of my career type shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where guys are coming out of camp. They're like, you know, it's good. There's a lot of accountability. People are really getting on the same page, blah, blah, blah. We know, we know the process. And it just feels like early season cliche stuff. Yeah. And so yeah. that's what... <laughs> It's a, a mess over there right now. Oh my god! This is like the day my um, the when my mic fell apart three times on the show. On the show. Yeah. yeah, this is gonna end with me holding my kitchen table just like this. I'm still holding my mic in my hand. So. Incredible! Oh my god, that was so funny. Uh, so yeah, I think you know again, like there's only so much you can go off of, but. It, Again, I think we need to wait 25 games yeah. for a coach because that's when you start to get an idea of the type of big picture trends from the team. You know what I mean? Like we're still at a point in the season where everything is fresh, everything is new. You know, like you said, as much as they've lost four of their five games, it doesn't the vibe around the team doesn't seem to quite feel that way. And that's not always going to be the case. They are going to have a four or five game losing streak where the team is going to feel like shit. And we're going to see how he responds, how this team responds. Um, I'll tell you what, though, man. He's he's a little bit of a, uh, of a hard ass in a way that I, I think um, certain players will definitely respond to. And I'm optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. But I, boy, hate to be here. But... So I think a thing I've noticed over the last probably 10 years is that there's been a trend in sports in general, and especially the NHL, to just give the captaincy to the best young player on the team. Eight out of 10 times you're making a change, right? right. Every now and then you get your uh, Thornton to Pavelski or Couture or whatever it was, yep. you know, Brown to Kopitar, that type of thing. But most of the time it's somebody retires and then – they give it to the next great young player on the team. And I felt like because Anaheim has been so fucking bad and Troy Terry has been the lone bright spot in the last two and a half, three seasons, that the rush to make him the captain has been impulsive. Not to say that I couldn't understand it a little bit with, you know, kind of the way he carries himself and things like that and mm. his level of play and things like that. But it just felt a little impulsive, and I always kind of wanted to wait. Hearing him talk about talking to Leo Carlson about his debut was very enlightening to me and really made me see how much more mature he is than you would maybe think for a guy who's as young in his career. Because, again, he played four years in college, so he's still relatively young in his yeah. pro career. I, I've been very impressed by him, and... I'll be very curious to see as this year goes along if he takes on more, a more prominent role in dealing with the media and stuff like that. Yeah, I I, I think so. I, I agree. Like with the the coaching side of things, like we do have to wait, um, twenty twenty five thirty game mark before we can kind of look at it and see if there's been any major impact on the players. Again, mm -hmm. like I said, they, they could. There's been good signs. Um, the, Absolutely, yes, yeah. and I'm not trying to take anything away from Cronin. This isn't a criticism. Mm -hmm. It is a we don't know yet. That's all. Yeah. So like the, the 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 issues we knew that would be there regardless of coaching are still there. The Ducks can't score goals. They just can't. They don't have the talent. The guys that they did add aren't in the lineup. Uh, up front, Kalorn is injured right now. Um, so you really can't, you know, that, that should help 
again, 20 to 30 goal scorer, inject that into the lineup that should help. Power play hasn't started that well, but we knew goal scoring was going to be an issue. Defensively, they're actually not bad. They're in about the middle of the pack. 15 goals allowed in five games. Uh, it's not awful. It's three goals per game. Uh, there are some te- there's certainly teams that are a lot worse uh, at this point. Last year, the Ducks were clearly dead last in that, and as well as shots against per game. They're not getting blown out, you know, 20 shots to five in the first period anymore. We're not having really that many uh, instances of that. I think it was the game against Boston, or maybe the game against Arizona, where they got outshot like 12 to 2 in the second period. Like, that's going to happen to any team at any point. But for the Ducks last year, like, this was a game by game occurrence. Every period. Uh, maybe the odd period they wouldn't get heavily outshot, but they would start games that way uh, and they'd have to claw their way back into it. Whereas this way, they seem to have started games a lot better. They've been in games. They haven't you know, taken themselves out of these games against you know, very tough opponents. That 4-1 loss to Vegas looks a lot worse. They were in that game throughout most of it. They were definitely in the game against Dallas, Arizona, and Boston. Really tight games that, despite the loss, again, were exciting to the end. So that's the, the main kind of takeaway that I've seen uh, is it's just been a bit more fight. And we need more games to you know, equate that to the coaching staff or just and you know the the players coming from a good off season excited about a new season rebounding from when they were dead last last year so who knows what it is at this point regardless the one thing that we can take away from it is it's definitely been a lot more fun to watch than uh, what we were used to seeing last year yes i think a hundred percent i think all of the signs are positive the way the young players have looked. Again, like we, you know, just like everything you said, you're right. Um, it's just really nice to kind of have that right now and have that positivity in general around this team. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and okay. fix it. You're good. Okay. No, but can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, anyways. Sorry, I got distracted for a second. No, you're good. Uh, but, like, yeah, so so the one main thing, we have to talk about it. I mean, this is one of the main topics that we're going to talk about in the show. Specifically, first, is Leo Carlson's debut. He's played two games so far. Both games he's centered the top line. Um, the last game against Arizona, over 21 minutes of ice time. Heavily featured in that game. Uh, scored his, his NHL, you know, scored on his NHL debut an assist from Troy Terry. Good shot from Carlson. He's looked more involved. He looked better in the second game. He looks comfortable physically. He doesn't look out, outmatched. He's making the right plays. His skating looks excellent. For me, he's checked all the boxes. You know, we you had posed this question. We put out an article, I believe, on and Anaheim Calling as well. Is what can we expect? from his debut and what what makes it a success does he have to record a point to score obviously he did score in that game i think if you take the goal out he still has a successful debut and when you look at both games as a whole um he's done everything you can ask for and the points are going to come the way he's playing and the, the the players he's playing with um but i've been more than impressed and uh i'm i'm certain like this is a guy that can stick around the entire year and and play and play top six minutes and top power play with this team because he already is good enough and one of the better players on the team that he deserves to be in that spot do you have a moment or a thing that stood out from you from that game because like you talked about he did score and like for me watching that goal like how immediately but how confidently he got that shot off was such a huge sign to me he didn't rush it he didn't over stick handle he didn't delay like you know there's a hundred different things that even good everyday nhl players mistakes you can make in that situation and he just took the pass and got that shit right into a top corner or Mm -hmm. you know high and away um, I don't remember quite where it ended up going in, but I believe it was like the top left corner area. Yep. You know what I mean? And and he just, he just, um, it, there was no hesitation. There was no uncertainty. There was no, he was just so confident and it was just so nice to see that. And I think, 
that that has kind of been the overwhelming takeaway from me early mm-hmm. is that he seems comfortable, not, you know, and again, just like we said with Greg Cronin, it's two games. That's it. In 10 games or whatever, he could hit a wall. He could get homesick for the first time, right? Like at this point, he's still high on adrenaline. There's still all this excitement and, and mm-hmm. possibility in front of him. Let's see just how Greg Cronin, how he responds to, you know, them losing four games and he's on game nine of, of a goalless streak or something like that, right? Right. Let's just see how he responds. But all the signs are there to be incredibly confident about his ability to handle those situations. And, and more importantly, I guess, projecting his long-term viability on this team. Like, mm-hmm. I, he looks so good, man. He's just – everything that we heard from Pat Rubik about why he drafted him, you see – he's played, what, 43, 44 minutes of NHL yeah. ice time? You, you've seen it. You've seen it there. Mm-hmm. It, it, they've – like, the, the perfect word you used there was comfortable. He's looked comfortable. It, there hasn't been a, a minute he's been on the ice where you've, like, you've looked at him and said, that's a rookie. You know what I mean? Like you, you just haven't, and, and I don't. I, I'm going to mention a guy, and I don't mean to pick on him here, but it's the only other option I can look at at the Ducks roster of a rookie where you said, okay, that's a rookie, and it's been Tristan Luno. He's there's been moments where he's looked great, but there have been a handful of moments where you're like, okay, yeah, that's a rookie, and you can understand it, and you can see that there's going to be development there. Um, Leo Carlson, 100%. When you've watched him play, you know you, you just he looks comfortable. He looks cool, calm, collected. Um, you know the hockey IQ is on on full display there, and, and a guy who clearly is thinking the game already at NHL level, and then also has the size already to compete physically at this level. He just looks like a guy that will continue to get better as the season goes on. And again, it's only been two games, but we saw improvement already from the debut to the second game. He dominated in that game against Arizona. He definitely should have got on the scoreboard. Um, that, that the Ducks power play was cooking. They didn't score. But that first unit looks like eventually when things get going and they figure it out and get some chemistry there and we've got questions about McTavish and putting him on the power play and whatever. We, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of room for improvement there. But when they do gel, there's enough there to look at and say, okay, like he's going to pick up the points here at some point. Uh, he's going to get going. The rest of it's there. Comfortable in defense, comfortable with the puck on his stick. He's been one of the, the, the Ducks' best forwards at breaking out of the zone into the opposition uh, blue line. He's just been a fun player to watch. Uh, him and Pavel Minchikov have both looked comfortable, calm, cool, collected, like they played an entire season in the NHL last year, right? Like they, they both look like they aren't rookies, which is unbelievable to say. And, and maybe you could say, I don't see you, you could expect it more of Leo Carlson, but you know, coming from a prof- a, a pro league playing against men, um, it's still a tough transition. But you could you could could have seen this again. He's six foot three. There's the you know there, there's there's signs that point to him having success Im- immediately. Pavel Minchikov has been a, a wonderful surprise. Not only uh, making the team above guys like Willem Zellweger and, and originally Tristan Luno, who's obviously played a couple games now, but in the process looking like the Ducks' best defenseman on both ends of the ice. Um, it's It's been a lot of fun mostly to watch just, again, because of these two exciting players uh, and then the rest of the team around them. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Minchikov is really interesting, especially, like you said, comparing him to, to Leno. Um and kind of the way in which they operate. And it's been really interesting, too, to hear Greg Cronin talk about Leno and, and specifically refer to Leno as an offensive defenseman when, you know, uh, I don't want to mischaracterize what he said, but it, my impression of when we talked to Scott Wheeler about this was that Leno was more of a solid two-way type guy who had had a really strong offensive year, and it was encouraging, and it looked like it was... Um, it, it wasn't a fluke, right? It was something where the process was repeatable and he could be a more impactful offensive uh, weapon at the next level, but it wasn't going to be his calling card to hear Greg Cronin talk about him. And then, and then to see the way in which Luno has uh, at times struggled a little bit in his own end, misread plays, different things like that. Uh, I think he's, he's a good size, but he's still not as physically mature as Minchikov or Carlson are. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, but then also to see him get active in the other zone and, and pinching down the boards and things like that. Like it, it, it's just, it's really exciting. I, I think like we were talking about earlier, the re- one of the big reasons why the mood around this team is so much more positive and optimistic than, you know, the paper would tell you is just how optimistic and how exciting it is right now to be a fan. Like, like there's a sense of optimism that is kind of pervading throughout this lineup because you've got these young players in these different positions, um, you know, throughout the lineup. Like, we're seeing Gru come up. Or Gru, I can never remember how to say his name. I think it's Gru. Mm. Uh, Bo Gru. And, like, he's come up, and he's looked really strong as a third-line center. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it, it seems like all the extra kind of waiting that Anaheim did with him over the last two, two and a half, three years has really paid dividends. He looks really strong. Uh, he looks very comfortable. Like he's he's made a couple mistakes or whatever, but again, like that is what makes Carlson stand out, and to an extent, Minchikov stand out. Is you're expecting mistakes from young players because it's the National Hockey League. It's really hard. Like yeah. the level of play is very high, and even you know, again, because we only ever see them play on their NHL teams, it can be easy to forget that even a team like the Ducks or like. Arizona are maybe not as talented or consistent or successful as the other teams. The guys in those rosters can still fucking play. Um, you know, like they're they're still able to go out there and make plays. Uh, the you know the, the difference between good players and great players and all that stuff is consistency and, and, and yeah. uh, intentionality in a sense. But like, it's nice to just see these guys going out and playing strong and to see the mistakes that the young players are making seems so easily correctable. Mm-hmm. Nobody looks completely out of their depth. I think the closest you would say to that would be Leno. And mm-hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if Leno went back. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's necessarily any rush to send him back. He hasn't been abysmal in the sense that you're like, okay, we got we to gotta get him back down to the minors. Yeah, yeah, I, genius, I, I guess. Yeah, I think he he sticks around for a little bit longer, and and like like you're saying, I don't think he's been bad. I think the main takeaway that I've seen is the game still moves a little quick for him at this level, mm-hmm. where he hasn't adjusted to that. And sometimes the adjustment curve is the next couple of games, and sometimes it is playing thirty or forty NHL games before you can kind of get adjusted to that level of play and that the speed of the game. That's just the one thing I've noticed with him is kind of been the the root of a lot of the mistakes he's made, some poor decisions and drop passes, and um, you know reads on the play defensively. I, I liked you know his tendency to jump into the rush. Um, I like what he's done offensively. Uh, you know I, I think he's been in good position. There's just been sometimes the game's moved a little quick for him, or he's made too mm-hmm. quick of a decision. Um, and I don't think it's led to any goals. I could be wrong there, but it's led to some some key chances for other teams. Um, but that's gonna happen. Like that's what you expect, honestly. Like it's 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 hard to criticize him when that's normally what you expect for you know an 18, 19 year old young defenseman coming into the league as a rookie and playing their first two NHL games because you're watching Pavel Minchikov do what he's doing right now and you're watching Leo Carlson do what he's doing in this first you know two games for Carlson and five games for Minchikov and you're you, you're holding them to that standard of the way they're playing and well, what it's it impossible really... not to compare them because they're playing yeah. next to each other right like exactly. that's part of it and and, yeah. and, and it's 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 not unfair to do so as long as you don't leave it down on Leno yeah. is what I would say because I think what you're seeing from Leno is like you're saying expected and it shouldn't leave you down on Leno because he's not at those guys' levels. It should leave you impressed with those guys because they're not yeah. be- because they're above that, which is a reasonable level for a rookie in his first you know three four games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they are um, playing better, better than most. Um, the fact that Minchikov is is entered himself prematurely, it's, it's early, but into the Calder conversation, not just among Ducks. Has friends. he? Um, yeah, he's been in Who have you heard say this? I'm curious. I haven't I, seen I, I, I have to go and look. So I've seen a few early rankings. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's mostly like fan blogs or um, you know, things like that. Where So it's nothing official. Sure, by sure, image, sure, but sure, sure. Where they've... A list of about ten guys for um, Calder. So you know, Bedard was obviously 
there. Um, Cooley was up there. Um, hmm. Carlson was on the list. Minchikov was on the list. Yurichek was on the list. A few other guys like that um, were on there. But Minchikov being on that list and being considered by people outside of Anaheim shows you the impact and the buzz that he's created mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, he's taken advantage of the opportunities that have been given to him. Obviously, Jamie Drysdale being out of the lineup means he got to go on to the power play. And not only that, the team said, well, we're going to give you power play one the way he's been playing. And He's looked excellent on, on, which on the power play, which is not going down that road. But yes, yes, yeah. he's looked great, and he he should have been on power play one from the beginning. It's fucking unconscionable, yeah. but yeah. it is what it is. Um, but power play one, I've, I've seen him on the penalty kill five on five. He's been uh, exceptional. He's doing everything uh, at both ends of the ice. He's like I mentioned this before the show. He's tied with Gudis for the hits lead with twelve hits on the team. He's got. His blocks. Um, he's making rushes up the ice. He's pinching at the right time. Uh, he knows when to carry the puck in the offensive zone or dish it off. Like he, he's always been that smart rush defenseman. The concerns with him were always going to be defensively, and and whether that's going to be short of at the NHL level. He doesn't look like like the, the best compliment I can give him is defensively. He doesn't look like the same player he was in junior. He looks like he right. worked on every, like I think that trade to Ottawa last year for him did wonders for mm-hmm. his development because in Saginaw he had to be the horse right. and the guy and he was like a another forward a fourth forward out on the ice for them because they didn't have a lot of talent there so he was given the license to do whatever he wanted. He went to an Ottawa team who were you know contending for an OHL championship. They had a lot of good older defensemen a lot of whom were considered offensive defensemen and man the, the power play unit so he was tasked with being a bit more of a two-way guy still could do what he does well which he's doing in anaheim right now and, and being an offensive threat but he was tasked a bit more in being solid at both ends of the ice and i, I mean that's what we've seen from him that you know if you go back and watch his clips from ottawa last year versus the way he's played for the ducks through five games that's the player that we're getting um, and it's been it's been exceptional to see. I, I I would have probably pegged Zellweger to be the guy to break out first, and then I would have had Minchikov tied with Luno for their chances of breaking out. Um, he has taken advantage of the opportunity given to him. He's looked amazing. Uh, he's he's I I can't if you the argument here. I don't think there is an argument, but you could put the argument that he's been the Ducks' best defenseman. But I think it's it's fairly clear that he has been the Ducks' best defenseman through five games, which is crazy to say for a guy who's playing his first five NHL games in his career. He has looked, and he's still 19 years old. He, he's looked unbelievable. Yeah, 100%. I think... Um, I've been trying to... While you're talking, I was trying to think how I wanted to say this because it made me think of it. Thinking about what is his kind of the the general like opinion of him and his time down in junior was, and I would say I think the thing that has allowed him to be successful early is his judgment, right? And it's like you said earlier, he's always been a smart hockey player, but specifically because he understands that like relative like it's funny like relative to the rest of the NHL and to the caliber of players, he is not as talented nor as impactful as he was in junior. But what's interesting is what that's going to do and has done so far is put him in a position to leverage the talent that he has to be the best version of himself. He doesn't, I I don't really remember a play with him clearly getting caught out of position yet. No. His pinches do not seem to have, at any point, aggressively cost the team. He's a good skater who can recover. He's got good sides. He's shown a willingness to get physical. But he drives open lanes, right? When he's attacking in the offensive zone, he's not inserting him into, into these plays at the cost of any sort of structure or cohesive plan. He's filling empty space and reading the play and putting himself in a position to make a play. And that's, I think, the thing that's been so exciting about him early is that judgment. He hasn't allowed himself to get caught out of position, and so it makes his incredible offensive talent that much more impactful because it's not coming at 
the expense of anything. He's really just seems to have a good understanding of where he's at and what he needs to do. And again, it's early. That's going to change. He's going to have, you know, he's going to have a bad stretch because every player has bad stretches. And it's just the way this goes, especially if you're a rookie. But all of the optimism is there. Like, this is, I think, the first time in a while that I have seen, like, oh, that could be a number one defenseman. Yeah. It's, it's just, there is a world where Anaheim's top, top pair in three years is Minchikov and Drysdale. And it's a nightmare for other teams because they're so smart and they're such good skaters and their ability to impact the play. And if you pair them with like a Leo Carlson smart center, or even a Nathan Gauthier smart center, you can start to see a way in which their just ridiculous offensive talent can can really impact the game at the next level. And it's really exciting. Yeah, it's it's been unbelievable what he's been able to do. Um, you know, Labushkin gets credit for being a, a perfect partner for him right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but just the play driving, like his 5-on-5 five five numbers, his Corsi 4 percentage is 56.43, which is... Uh, sorry, 56.25. Only Zegris is higher than him. I guess you, you can't really count back and in his 14 minutes of ice time um, at being any higher. But it's Zegris, Minchikov, Leo Carlson, Troy Terry, Vitrano, Labushkin, and then Silverberg, who are all above 50%. Um, Minchikov is the only defenseman other than Labushkin, who is his partner. The next highest defenseman would be Jackson Lacombe at 47.95, who's also looked very good as well and then on the expected goals for percentage side of things uh minchikov is again by far and away the leader there it's you know the three forwards who are at top zegris carlson and troy terry which is understandable like they have been so dynamic when they've been on the ice together um you know there really aren't too many too many times that they're hemmed in their own zone they're usually controlling the play just the the offense will come for them based off of the sustained zone time that they've gotten. But Minchikov being that high up the list, just like his play driving ability and his playmaking has been on display. And then, like you said, he hasn't made any mistakes defensively. He's played physical and he's engaged with the opposition. He's just looked so well-rounded that it's it. I, I can't believe it, man. Like I, there's, there's, there's only so many good things I can continue to say uh, right, about right. his start. Like I've, I've, I can repeat myself a million times, but I've just been so impressed with him. Uh, it's, it's such a shot in the arm for the Ducks' um, development and how their season's going to look this year. That one of these guys took the reins and immediately started off as well as he has. Uh, and the good thing for him is, without the points pouring in, he's done well offensively. Don't get me wrong, but he looks good without putting points on the board. And the opportunities are going to be there if he continues to be on the, the top power play unit. He's out there late in the game when the Ducks need a goal. It's Labushkin and, and Minchikov who are out there. It's not Cam Fowler who's out there, right? It's it, That that speaks volumes Don't do that for... To me. Don't set me up like that. <laughs> no, but it, it, it it's something we wouldn't have seen last year. And I forgot, I wanted to mention this earlier, and I didn't, I, I completely slipped my mind. But the, one of the big differences we've seen is the right players being out there at the right time. And, and I think you can give credit to the coaching staff for that so far, but the decision to put the right players in there out there at the right moments, we're not seeing, and, and no, again, no discredit to these guys, but we're not seeing Sam Carrick on the power play. We're not seeing Brett Leeson on the power play. We're seeing the power, the guys, you know, the top skill fours, we're seeing them on the power play. We're seeing the right guys. We're seeing Bogru. We're seeing Leeson. We're seeing Sam Carrick on the penalty kill. We're seeing Pavel Minchikov get rewarded for his play, get on power play one, stick there, and then be given opportunities to play in, in key situations. We're seeing Zegris and Terry and Leo Carlson on the ice with two minutes to go when they're down by a goal, right? Like, we're seeing these guys... Seeing them with two minutes into the game with everything. Which we'll get into. Yeah. So, we're, but we're, we're seeing these guys in the right moments, and, and, and that's what I do like to see because I they should be rewarded for their play. Mm-hmm. And Minchikov should be given these opportunities because he's played so well and he's been by far and away the Ducks' best defenseman. Um, and then Leo Carlson, again, you know, we, we have to circle back to him in, in the two games that he's played, the opportunities he's been given playing over 22 minutes a night in, in game two because he had played so well 
immediately getting the opportunity to not only center line one but be on the top power play. Um, you know, he he has been as good as advertised. There are things he could work on, and they're minor things. You know, he's lost eight of his nine faceoffs. If he's going to play center long term, we're going to want to see that turn around. But I'm sure that's not the main focus for them right now. That will be a, as the season develops thing that he'll continue to get better at that. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now it's it's about doing the little things, and he's done it all. But you know the the main topic we we have to get into here, and it's been the discussion, uh, a, a, a hot topic. Real on, quick, um, I have a question for you. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about this watching the game last night. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask it as as my opinion. Is this the most talented roster since the team that made it to the West during conference finals against the Blackhawks? Yeah, I, I it has uh, the, the, I, the most potential yeah. to be, right? No, like, but, uh, yeah, I'm not even. But I mean, raw fucking talent, even the unproven talent. But like, mm-hmm. looking at what we've seen so far, the talent that is there, whether it pans out or not, mm-hmm. this is the mo- like, yeah, this yeah. is the most talented team, maybe especially at forward. Yeah, even, that even. this team has had. Since, what the second to last year, the Boudreaux era, yeah. like that's crazy. Well, yeah, just the, the way these guys have come, like we haven't, we barely mentioned him to Jackson Lacombe has looked like an NHL he's player. Fucking awesome. He's looked great. I um, joked about it last night. He had a, a little whiff on the puck at the blue line. It was the first time he made a, a non NHL play all, all year. Yeah, so like, you, he you he just it. looks solid. It, it's the guys that have come out and done well so they produced mctavish for toronto and strom have produced the numbers and they've done very well that way the guys who maybe haven't produced but have looked good is zegris terry and carlson they've put up points but not as much as maybe you'd expect based off the play but they've looked good the bottom six defensively has looked great you've got guys like bo grew who've stepped up and he's been on the top penalty kill, he's been a good defensive forward. The points aren't there. But, again, this is a team that's not going to score a ton of goals, and the offense is going to have to come from the top six. But he's looked good. Jones has looked good. Leeson's looked good. Like, everybody's looked good. And then you go to the blue line. You've got, you know, Labushkin, who's come into the lineup and done wonders with Pavel Minchkov. And all of a sudden, Pavel Minchkov is the exactly what Yeah. He's been exactly what you wanted Labushkin to do. Yeah. Like, like I was watching him last night, and he literally, like, in one thing, he made a check behind the net, he came out front, he blocked the shot, he swung his stick, he knocked the book into the boards, and then they got it out of the zone. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, dude, that's the fucking dude that they traded for. Yep. That's exactly that dude. Like, and, and it's just like, like, like that's the thing. Like, and, and I think this is, is the, the best way I can explain why I feel this way about the talent. The young players have the young players on the team have come in and supplanted the older players, mm-hmm. and there is every visible reason that they have done so. It is obvious that these are play because, like, that's the thing that happens a lot of times with bringing in younger players to more competitive veteran rosters. Is there's not always places in the top six or the top four of your defense to play them sometimes. Mm-hmm. You have to play them on the third or even the fourth line, depending on how you run things. You have to play guys on the bottom pair, things like that. And and as fans, it's always really easy to say, play them in the top. It's like, yeah, but the guys who are in the top are in the top for a reason. And as much as we can see that these are the guys who are going to replace them, they're not there yet. Whereas with this team right now, everybody who is super young in the position that they're in absolutely belongs in the position that they're in. It makes total sense. And I just think... I don't. I think that's the thing to me. Like more than coaching has just been how talented this roster is. There's just so much top to bottom talent right now on this roster that, man, if it doesn't pan out, oh, is it gonna hurt? Because that's gonna mean a bunch of stuff went weird. It yeah. really looks right now like at the very least this is a team that should be pushing for a legitimate wild card spot in three years. Yeah, yeah, uh, they've done. Again, like the the fact that we're not coming into this episode talking about the fact that the Ducks are one and four and looked like total shit mm-hmm. is something to be said about the the players that have stepped up and how they've played and the commitment that we've seen. Like there there really hasn't been any sore spots. There hasn't been anybody that hasn't mm-hmm. looked 
either what we expected from them, if not better. Um, it's still just, again, it's not a great team on paper. There's not a lot of supporting cast. There's a lot of young players that are going to take steps forward over the next couple of years. They're not going to be mm-hmm. a good team. But the fact that they are taking good teams to task and, and getting pretty close to beating them and making it a competitive affair and not getting blown out, that's if you had have said you know at the beginning of the season what you know if that if that's what you're going to get through the first five games that's really all you can ask for you would love to win all five games and, and start five and zero oh, but the Ducks just aren't at that point right now especially the schedule they had to open the the regular season but to be competitive in those games against some of the top teams in the NHL is really all we wanted last year we just didn't want to be blown out anymore <laughs> and, and get outshot forty to twenty uh, by the end of the second period right so. That's that's all you could ask for going in, in into this season is the way they've played the hustle's been there you know there's a lot of excitement you can tell among not only the fans but the players and and the way mm-hmm. you know some of these guys have stepped forward there, there's a light at the end of the tunnel that's got a little bit brighter with the, the the way that these guys have stepped up you know again we've talked about the rookies coming in but the way Mason McTavish has started the season as well coming into his second season Jamie Drysdale in two games he looked exceptional unfortunately got hurt but when mm-hmm. he comes back into the lineup you add that to the mix on the blue line and you know Rakanainen comes out or Luno comes out and Drysdale fits right in there and then you've got three rookie defensemen that look like they belong or I know Drysdale's not a rookie anymore but, but still pretty close the point to is it. well taken yeah. the point is well taken yeah you've got Minchikov Drysdale Lacombe on the deep pairing with Fowler Gudis and Labushkin uh, and they all look pretty good and 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 things have they've solidified it there's no Uncertainty. There's no, oh, Lacombe doesn't look that great, so who's going to come up? We're going to have to play back in iron, and are we going to call up Zellweger? They've, they've all looked good. And there's no, mm-hmm. there's none of that chaos around the roster right now. There's none of like, oh, man, you know, McTavish hasn't looked good, or Leo Carlson hasn't looked that great. You know, we don't really have anybody in San Diego to call up. Are we going to have to wait till Kaloran comes back or Lindstrom comes back to. You know, to get anything out of this roster, no, no. Everybody has settled in into their role and done what you could ask for them. And, and, and honestly, looking at this team, they do look a little unlucky at times. Like there are there are signs that if they continue to play this way, you feel like things could get better because they are doing the right mm-hmm. things, especially on the power play. Like they should have. They've had some good looks, and once that chemistry I think starts to gel and they get the, the you know the the right setup going. Um, things are going to start to go for them there, and, and again, we're going to see some more improvements there. So it, it's it's just been exciting in that in that way that they are seemingly doing the right things, um, and there is room for this to get a little bit better. Mm-hmm. All right, let's do it. All right, Eddie, I yeah, need we, we've you been... to explain to me <laughs> why I am wrong about my opinion that this sh- the top line should not be Zegers, Carlson, Terry. Oh, okay. I thought we were getting into. I don't like it. I okay. I'm on the record as saying I hate it. I don't. I yeah. Again, I, it looks great. I get why everybody this, loves so, it. So yeah, but this was before. This was also before they played. So you still have this opinion now, but you. Yes. To, to this is make the opinion sure I came has. into the season with. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because I know they run in. I think a couple of preseason games or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it, it had made its way around. And I don't like. It. I didn't like it then. I've seen it. I get why everybody loves it. I still don't like it. Um, why am I stupid? My, my question for you then is, is, is it a n- not liking stacking your top three guys on one line, right? Yes, because I feel the, the same thing. way about not stacking your number one power play. Okay, yeah. I hate, I hate both of them. I, I think for me, it is short-sighted. No, no. In, so in theory, in a vacuum, I agree with you. I don't like the premise of it. I generally don't like putting my three best players on the top line and stacking my top power play and not having options in the bottom, you know, the, the second line and the, in the third line or on the second power play where you're you're really putting all your chips in, in one basket and saying, like, this has to pan out or the second unit that I send out there, it's right. not going to work. I will say where you are wrong at the time being is – McTavish for John Strom have looked excellent. Like they have been mm-hmm. unbelievable. Where to the point where they have been the Ducks' best line, and you can't split them up. So the next option then is: Do you take one of Carlson, Terry, and Zegris and play them on the third line? And I think at that point it's counterintuitive to have them playing with having Terry playing with Guru and Henrique rather than playing with Carlson and Zegris, especially how good they've looked. So I think. 
you are right and you are wrong. I will cop out with that answer in the sense that the theory makes sense. Mm-hmm. If McTavish, Stroman, and Vitrano were struggling, I think you would have to move away from stacking that top line, no matter how good they looked. If Leo Carlson and, and Zegris and Terry were look, still looking exceptional, but the rest of the team was struggling, I think then you have to look at splitting things up, moving guys around to help you know, facilitate team offense as a whole. But with the way McTavish, Strom, and, and Vitrano have been playing, I, I don't see why not keep riding that line. Whether it stays like that, we'll see. I don't know if it'll be like that for the rest of the season. Ideally, if it if it was, it means that that second line is continuing to chug along, and you know you have the luxury of playing those three guys together. Um, but even on on the top power play, like right now, you've got you still have McTavish, you still have Vitrano on the second unit so you still have some of those guys down there to to make an impact and and um and give that second power play some juice so uh, again that's probably going to get moved around and we have questions later on about moving mctavish up to power play one and being the trigger man there but i don't hate it right now but i will say at some point this season, if things change, I could be on the same boat as you. But I think you're wrong at this point just because there has been success from the rest of the lines that I don't think mm-hmm. is beneficial moving one of those guys down from top six to, to the third line. I just don't see the point in that right now. I don't see – I feel like they are wasted playing on a line with Benoit Olivier Gru and, and, and Adam Henrique. And I love both of those guys. Mm-hmm. I just don't see the point in that at, that, at this point. So that that's an that's an interesting point that the other three lines have played well enough within the the expectation of what they're going out there to do, right? Because uh, obviously you're not looking at all three of those lines to have the same effect on the game, right? Like as much as we want to talk about role four lines and things like that, we also understand that different players have different roles and things of that nature. Yeah. So, so this, in the sense of there is no overwhelmingly there's there's no overwhelming reason to need to break up that top line so you can afford to leave it together because everybody else is doing fine. I get that. To me, the success that the McTavish Stroman Vitrano line makes me want to separate the top line more because I think especially once Kalorn comes back the opportunity to play three centers Mm -hmm. is incredibly exciting I have to say that I have been incredibly surprised and impressed with how well Strom has played early on. He is the part of the top six that I am, that I was the least prepared for. Because we talked about it last year. Petrano gets the puck, Petrano shoots the puck. And he's going to do that. And he's done it. And he's like, like that's just what he is and what he's going to do. And he's been awesome on the four check. He's been. You know, he's been engaged defensively and all that stuff. But, like, his role on this team is going to be to shoot the fucking puck. And I think you can very easily put that guy in your onto your top two lines and see how he helps. Strom is a guy who, coming out of last year, I was pretty down on. Um, I, I was really kind of bummed about what he was going to bring to this lineup and about his ability to be impactful. And whether it's the new coach whether it's McTavish has taken a leap over the summer, uh, you know, whether it's Strom being in a better place than he was last year, right? It was his first year after moving from New York, all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, it, there's a thousand different reasons that could lead to him playing this year. If this is for real, if he's really this guy right now, and this mctavish Petrano strom line is a line that they can play for 75 games, that's incredibly exciting. And once Kalorn comes back, the idea of being able to go Zegris and Kalorn anchoring one line and Carlson and Terry anchoring another is very exciting. Yeah. So that, and, that, and, there's where I agree. There's, there's where I would agree with you too. Is, is Kalorn coming back it opens up a whole different possibility for having three solid lines. 
where it doesn't feel a little bit wasted putting them down there. Um, are you are you then saying Zegris is a center at that point, right? You're running Zegris, yeah, McTavish, I, I Carlson? Think, I think Carlson looks good enough already that I I think it's worth seeing if you can basically run out three centers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a lot there to be excited about. Uh, frankly, I think in a lot of ways, and again, like these comparisons are always weird because they can lead you into weird places, but you start to get into point Sorelli Gord kind of territory, right? Where you're like, we've got three guys down the middle that we can run out in a number of different situations. And and it doesn't really matter how you you match up against this because we know these guys can win matchups regardless. Uh, you know, the, the, the classic example of that, I guess, would be the Penguins when they had Jordan Stahl as their third-line center role. He was clearly overqualified for it. Uh, and, and, and again, I've been very clear on this. I don't have a problem with playing Zegers on the wing. But, like, fuck you, Carlson. Terry seems to be enough. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So if you can then, again, run out specifically the Kalorn Zegers line, like, I, there's a lot there to really, really like. You can really have an opportunity to win more matchups because you have three different sets of guys who can drive play and who can play responsibly and and, and who can put the puck in the back of the net. Like that's, that's so enticing to me. And this is the year where you see if you can do that. Um, you know, especially with, uh, uh, Carl's going to be missing some games, which we'll get into. But also the fact that, again, this year doesn't have the expectations that, based on the way this year's going, next year might. You know, and again, this is all super overreacting early stuff, but still, the level yeah. of play is there to be excited about this team maybe being a mid 80 point team next year. So, like, this is the year where you throw those three guys out there, you see if you can run three lines, you really try to go for it. Because now, if you're looking at Bo Grew, as your fourth line center, you're in a really good spot. That's a really good spot to be in. Jones, Grew, and Leeson. I like that line. Mm-hmm. I really you got like that. And line. Johnson to rotate in when you need them to. So. You've got Silverberg. You know yeah. what I mean? Like there are players. Again, that doesn't account for Lundstrom when he comes back. We haven't even talked about Brock McGinn when he comes back. Like again, I think there is this really exciting opportunity to win more than one matchup a night. I, I like it. I think I really like Zegers with Kalorn. I really like Carlson with Terry. If you want to run that route, I think keeping Mc, hopefully McTavish, Strom, Vitrano staying together and they, they can stay together for 70 games means they're can, continuing to have success. Um, I think at that point, Henrik, it's probably uh, Carlson, Terry, Henrik, and Zegers, Kalorn, mm-hmm. Silverberg is, is probably what, mm-hmm. what you see at this point, which I, I don't hate. I, I do like it. Um, a lot of it just depends on their long-term projections of Trevor Zegers. He's playing center, I think, because he has to right now uh, when when Carlson's not in the lineup. But it does speak volumes to me that when Carlson is in the lineup, they've opted to, to have him on the wing um, because of where they want and Carlson I, and, and where they want Zegers in the lineup. I, yeah. I, get, I, I think the natural appeal of Zegers and Carlson is awesome. And that's why for me, like, again, like, I, you know, as we've talked about it once we did him, like, I have been a big fan of Terry and McTavish together and seeing the idea yeah. of Zegers and Strom together, or, uh, sorry, Zegers and Carlson together is very exciting. But that line with Strom and Vetrano is playing so well and they are so effective. Now the question is, what do we do with Troy Terry? And, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's like, how do we get the most out of Troy Terry? How do we get the most out of Zegers? How do we get the most out of Leo Carlson? Like, how can we get the most out of these guys? And maybe in the long run that is playing them together and letting them go out there and just run over people at five on five. I, I can certainly understand the allure of it. Like I said, they look really good. But if you have the opportunity to win three out of four line matchups, yeah. I don't think that's something we should be dismissive of. No, nope. and I think nope. that's an incredibly exciting opportunity to really cultivate an incredible energy and and level of competition around this team. Yeah, and and listen, that, that's a that this is also a short term thing as well. It it this is a this season lineup we're talking about. Whereas mm-hmm. in the future, 
you could be looking at Carlson, McTavish, and Goche down the middle. And Zegers gets to play on the wing. And you still mm-hmm. get that matchup that you want of having three lines that roll out there. Yeah, you can absolutely. still run Carlson and Terry and whoever on the left wing. You could hopefully still run McTavish, Strom, Vertrano, and then maybe you run Zegers with, with Goche and, and somebody else on the right wing and, and you know play all these guys 17, 18 minutes a night and, and just rotate them through and, and you know mm-hmm. like you said, win every matchup that you have a chance to win. So I, I like it. I, I'm, I'm interested to see where they go. I think Kalorn coming back really presents an interesting conundrum for this team, a good one to, to just try and find where to fit a good player and where yeah. he fits well. But I, I would love to see Carlson and Terry just seem like a match made in heaven um, mm-hmm. to play yeah. together. Um, and um, Zegers, I think, with Carlson would be a, an, an, a, or not with Carlson, with Kalorn would be a nice, interesting fit. And you don't really, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter again who plays on, on the right with them. I think Silverberg, again, just being a natural right winger makes sense there with Henrik being the left winger, making sense to go with, with Carlson and Terry. But I, I like those duos. Right, I like mm-hmm. I like the 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 feel of Zegers and Klorin and the feel of Carlson and Terry, um, and we've seen that kind of immediate chemistry with Carlson and Terry, and obviously with Zegers as well. But uh, the two of them seem right. to link up at all times, especially when uh, when when you get in the zone and you've got Carlson and Terry making plays for you. Um, it's very very difficult for the opposition team to get the puck back. Or no, Carlson's going to make you know the the smart decisions. He's going to stretch the play. He's going to make the passes and. You got Troy Terry attacking people, attacking the triangles, creating space. He, like he's, somebody tried to uh, take him out on the board. No, I don't. I don't I'm, I'm using the wrong words because I don't want to say something because I'm being stupid. Uh, but he was coming up from the, the offensive goal line. He was coming up the left hand boards, and a guy tried to pin him to the wall, and he just snuck right through. He took the puck right along the blue line, and I was just like. Bro, he looks so fucking confident. He looks so confident right now with that puck on his stick. It yeah. is remarkable. And he seems, you know, really invigorated by by what this team might be able to be and stuff. And then uh, just one more thing real quick I wanted to mention about, well, I guess two things, but the same thing in a sense. Kalorin coming back gives us that first puzzle for Cronin to solve and see what he does with it. Yep. I also think the last 20 games of this season – so for Berg and Henrik are not on this team. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, well, we're talking about all the guys who can come back, and there's mm-hmm. guys in San Diego right now as well. Like there, there are going to be opportunities to move guys, and the team's going to be in a position where they're they're likely not fighting for a playoff spot, um, and in you're in forced into moving these guys. I think Henrik's in the last year of his contract anyway, right? He's moving. Henrik to, and Silverberg, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think ultimately both of them moved out. For Toronto's another one you could look at. Potentially, he's got two years left, and there will be teams who are looking Don't you dare. to. Don't start. Don't I, start I with listen. He. I'll fight you the, right the, now. The, the question will be brought up because if he continues to play like this, there are going to be teams. And there's guys like this that are moved every year that are on a nice kind of contract. A team, you know, the Ducks could eat fifty percent of it. You know, the teams that are up against the cap, the Toronto's, the Tampa Bay's, are going to call and say, "Listen, we can get this guy for two years." If Toronto plays this way, you telling me he can't get what, you know, maybe a little bit less because he's a little bit older, but what Brandon Hagel got, right? Like that type of you are package, not first, two uh, first round picks for Frank Petrano. or like a first, second, especially not a first a and a second or something like that, right? Like You're again, he would have to maybe be a good prospect. He would have to prospect. be at like a forty points in fifty games mark at that point and 20 sure. goals already something like that like i'm saying he would have to keep up this ridiculous pace which again it's it likely not going to happen but i think that's where you get into the debate of do you move him at that point like he he would have to be playing so well and continuing to play so well that some team is going to come to you with an offer because he's got that those two years that you're like wow we got to take this right so i i think i think he'll be in the mix there i don't think it would be strom i definitely think henrik and silverberg are likely going to be on the move but i think for toronto yeah. gets added added into that mix as a possible guy who could be out the door at some point and not and not no, for any I, fault I, look, of his own, other than just for the fact that he's played so well, and and there's so many teams interested and that are willing to pay to to get a guy like that in that shoots the puck every well, time I he gets it. I think we heard his name this summer too, a little bit. Yeah, we heard he it that last year too. I think yeah. or we speculated. Yeah, was, I think so. that's right. So yeah. you know, no, I, I just don't don't trade him. No, I I, 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 I love, love him on the team. Dude, we we need guys he's like him who can spiritually, uh, dude. He's such yeah. a pure Anaheim Duck. Yeah, like he's a little bit reckless. He's a lot insane. 
he he like he rocks man i i very much love him mm-hmm. um so eddie uh i need you to explain to me now why does the anaheim ducks front office hate their fans and why are they trying to punish them by sitting leo carlson some games this year Obviously, they don't think he's ready because if he was ready and if he was really uh, a legit first round pick and prospect, he would be able to do all of this immediately because that's a normal and rational thing for people to think. So why do they hate the fans or why is he a bust? Explain yourself, sir. I like it. especially um, with Bedard and Fantilli playing every game for their team right now. Right. Like that's, <laughs> that's I feel like what a lot of people have keyed in on. Um Listen, like, I do I want this kid to play every game? Sure. And what was I disappointed he didn't play uh, against the Bruins? Yes, man. Like he, they're they're playing so well that it's so fun watching him out there. There's all there's a little bit of extra excitement when he's on the ice for the Ducks that you're like, okay, this you know the, the second overall the whole the whole aspect of it, the fact that he's gonna you know has potential to be a franchise center. Like you want to see this guy on the ice every day. I completely get it. I understand the frustration. But when you sit back and you look at it and you look at their explanations, I, mean, I know there haven't been, you know, any official statements essentially of what they're planning on doing. But the the, the comments that have come out from Verbeek and and through others, through guys like Eric Steven, have been that the Ducks feel that this kid has played more hockey than anybody over the last 365 days, and he just he's going to need a rest on the back to backs pretty much. He's still going to play 60 to 70 games for the Ducks this year, ideally. But for for games like that, where you're going, you know, into a, a, against a tough team against the Bruins, you played the night before, played 22 minutes the night before in a hard-fought game that they ended up losing, that they felt the need that listen, we're going to sit guys, this guy for games like that. I get it. Like I can understand the thought behind it and why it makes sense. Let's not burn this kid out by game 50. They and and this was the quote that I think that that came out from from Pat Verbeek is that they want this kid to be a beast in the second half of the right. season. They they I think they fully I, expect that they might be able to make a push, right? And they if they're in a position if they're around five hundred, I like there's a chance, right? If they think this kid can be what he can be, they can unleash him in the second half with Kalorn coming back that. They have a better shot of doing that if he's not burnt out by game 30 or game 40, right? So, again, maybe that's not the, the whole thought process and isn't because they think they can make a playoff push, even if it's just they want this kid to be able to play a full NHL season without dying on the ice, then I'm I'm fine with it. It makes sense. Like, again, he did play almost more games than anybody last year. Like He played SHL games against men. He played SHL playoffs. He played uh, World Juniors. He played World Championships. Like, he played a lot of hockey last year so i i get it and if it if i hope it's just back to backs um so there's not a ton of games that he's sitting but uh we'll have to see right like what we've is got too three... many games what like what is too many games year, for him to play no at the end of the year or sat what is too many games for him to sat or how what is the minimum number of games he should play he should play by the end of this year let's say completely healthy right let's let's remove the idea of injury from it just for the sake of having the conversation. And let's just say it's entirely voluntarily sitting him as a maintenance program going forward. I think he's got to play 70. You think he's got to play 70 games? Yeah, I think sitting him for 12 games. and Because just, again, based on what they said, this seems like a, a, a first half of the season thing, right? I mm-hmm. can see him sitting 10 games in the first half here, in the first, in the first 50. I think he could sit 10. And then okay. pretty much play out the rest of the season from there. And I think it, it's it's being a little bit, I don't know, uh, pessimist, pessimistic to be say seventy. He could play seventy five. He could only sit seven games this year. Like I, I don't, I don't think they're gonna sit him. Now again, we have to see what the plan is because right now it only, it only looks on paper like it's gonna be back to backs. They have three mm-hmm. games this week: Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. If he sits one of those, then we get a, a little bit more of an idea of what the plan is. If they're going to just sit him, Mm -hmm. you know, once every three games, we can start mapping that out a little bit, right? Once he's played a few more games um, and we can see, you know, the, the depth of the schedule and how they're going to sit him. I I think this, this week specifically, we'll get an idea a bit more of the plan, right? And and be able to tell. So here's, here's what's really interesting. This is actually a perfect three week period 
to get the idea of what it is. Mm-hmm. It's a third. It's a Tuesday game, Thursday game, Saturday game, Monday, Wednesday, Sunday, Tuesday, Friday, Sunday. Yeah, that is a very normal, mm-hmm. reasonable NHL schedule. I don't think he plays all those games. I yeah. think he misses. I think he misses three max three. Max three. Yeah. I think he'd miss, and like, and and that's because I think they might be on this schedule here of he sits. One of th- every three. Let's see. Uh, I'm looking. I'm trying to see where the back-to-backs are in the future. Yeah, we got and two of them out of the way early. There's so. one in middle of December. But yeah, because look, I'll be honest with you. In January, I, I think I would play him 65 games this year. Mm-hmm. I, I think I would just on the schedule find take out the back-to-backs off the jump, right? Yeah, and then however, I don't know how many that is off the top of my head, but then from there, like I, I think between like sixty five, seventy, if if he really can do it, like, but yeah. I, again, like I made this comment on Twitter, like this is and and this is fans failing the marshmallow test. This this is failing the marshmallow test. You're like, I want this thing right now. I don't want to wait. That's yeah. all it is. There's no long term. There's no inherent long term benefit to playing him eighty two games this season. There just fucking isn't. There's nothing that is inherently going to make him a better player in the long run. Now, there is a perception that there could be some detriment to his body's ability to recover. Yes, he's still very young, but he's also still growing. Like, he's still physically maturing. Mm -hmm. He's a young kid. So that's good, and his body is very uh, adaptable and very easy to cover but at the same time you also don't want to push it you want to let his body continue to develop so the fact that is when he's 21 or 22 in a couple of years he's playing 82 games and if we're really really lucky he's playing about 95 games that'd be awesome it'd be super cool i don't think he has to play 70 fucking games this year for me to think he's i am going to be far more concerned with the level of play than how many times he plays this year Yes. Yeah. If you're going to have him here for the full year, I think you've got to get him somewhere between 60 and 70 games. Mm-hmm. But I do not feel that there should be any real need to, one, give him to any perceived fan particulars, and two, to feel the need to rush him and, and, and not give his body the ability to, to rest. The reason younger guys only play certain schedules is because they're younger guys. Like it's not good for younger players to play all these types of games. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's a testament to his ability and his maturity that he was able to do so. But he said it himself. He was pretty fucking tired this summer. He really just needed a break. Mm-hmm. Let him take it in his rookie year where there are no stakes. This this is the thing for me that I I, I would simply ask people to think about is what are the stakes? This year is no stakes. Worst case scenario, this team sucks out loud all fucking year, and we end up back in the top three of the draft. This is a good year to be in the back of the top three, especially since technically we won the lottery last year, and you could only win two in three or four years or whatever it is now. This would be a great year to get that second one out of the way, take that out of our concern, and just be like, yo, let's fucking go. Pedal to the metal. We've got these young kids uh, in juniors and in the minors that we are really excited about. We, you know, Carrie Terrence. Uh, uh, or Case K- K- no Carrie Terrence, Colson Petrie, like yeah. these 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 young players that look like they could fill out. You still got Braden Tracy, you still got Jacob Perot, Tyson Hines, Drew Ellison. Like there's all these players that over the next couple of years we're going to be a, a lot more invested in, a lot more interested in working in. Take this year. There's nothing to be gained this year by pushing this kid. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to be aggressively conservative. I am just seeking. And taking advantage of the situation that we are in where he is clearly ready to play at this level, but there's also no rush to force him to be a true number one center 80 games of Bucky. There's nothing to be yeah. gained. If he, if he sits uh, one of every three until game 50, let's say game 52, because that would be game 50 for him barring any injury, um, mm-hmm. he would have he'd play 34 games. So it's not awful. And then... If they that's sixty-six say, games at the end of the year. Yeah, and if, if he they, just if, plays every game out after. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's if they stay games. true to what they've said, then if at the second half of the season they want him to kick it into gear and play mm-hmm. every night, 
you're right there. You're at your 60 to 70 game range if they sit him once every three games um, leading up to the 50 game mark or the 52 game mark for, for the Ducks, right? So I, I think that's mm-hmm. fine. I'm fine with that. Honestly, for me, if he plays more than 60, I'm fine with that. I, I, yeah. Anything less, I feel like they're, they're, they're babying him a little bit, especially if they are going to front load these sits. It's going to be a lot to get them to that point. If they stretch it across mm-hmm. the entire season, then maybe you see. But again, um, I, I like the plan of let's sit him early. He's played a lot of hockey. That's the main reason we're doing this. We want to make sure he's ready to go and, and is able to play a full season. So we're going to sit him early, and then near the end, the end of the year, we're going to evaluate and see how he is, you know, around that 50, 50 game mark. And we're going to let him loose and let him go. I like that. I'm mm-hmm. fine with that. I find that similar in a sense to what they did when Zegers and Dreiser weren't ready and sent them to San Diego just at an elevated level. Instead of he's not ready, mm-hmm. we're going to send them down to play games and they're going to play 50 games in the NHL this year and 30 games in San Diego or whatever. He's going to play 60 games in the NHL. He's just going to sit the rest early on to make sure that he can get through the entire season and not burn out. Right, like, and, and that that hurts his development more than anything. If they overplay this kid, and he gets yep. burnt out by game sixty, and the final stretch, twenty game stretch of the season, he looks gassed and looks terrible because he just is so tired from the amount of hockey that he's played. That's the marshmallow test. This that I'm, I'm not being funny. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's everything to be gained and nothing to be lost. Yep. By doing it this way early on. And there is a, a – there is, again, I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but there is a risk with pushing him, which they clearly believe in, mm-hmm. because they're like, dude, you've played a lot of fucking hockey. We're going to give you a couple a couple days to just kick it. You know, and, and, and again, they have apparently, as we heard from Derek and uh, – Derek Lee and Eric Stevens, they've communicated with his agent. His agent is all the way on board – Bro, if that wasn't the case, like if his agent had concerns, sure. Then we start getting into interesting territory where it's like, why is this person who has the player's best interest in at heart theoretically, and the team who again theoretically has the player's best interest at heart, why are they seeing this so differently? Apparently, everybody's on board. Mm-hmm. That should tell you everything you need to know. So I, I again, I just. I, I, I get why it's frustrating. I get why fans want to see this guy more often than not. But the goal is to see him more often than not over the next 15 years. And pl- yeah, not and, and playing at a high level the even next this 15 year. months. E- even this year is, is to see every time he is on the ice that he is playing at a high level and he's not burnt out. Right? Like, I right. would rather see him play yep. 60 games at a high level than 50 games at a high level and 30 games where he just looks gassed. Right, like that. I, yeah. I'd rather him, and it's my, like, listen, I'm 100%. disappointed too. I'm disappointed he didn't play against Boston. It made the game a little bit less enticing for me. I still tuned in. I still was excited to see the rest of the guys play. But there's that feel about it, like, oh, man, he's not playing. Like every everybody went into the game with that, like, ah, oh, man, that that kind of sucks a bit because we want to see this kid play. So I get it. I sympathize with it. But you got to sit back and and look at the big picture and understand, like, we want this kid not only to play well this season. And, and pan out and, and his development to continue to trend upwards for this season is we're looking into next season and beyond and, and being able to manage this guy and make sure that he can play 82 games and, like you said, hopefully 95, 100 games in, in, in a regular season into playoffs where right. um, he is contributing at a high level. So I'm fine with it. Um, I th- I'm interested to see how this week goes and how they handle it this week. Mm-hmm. Just, just really get an idea of what they are. I do think he'll sit one of the games this week and I, I think we'll find out that they are probably on this true sit one every three games type schedule but we'll see they, I mean, again there is a chance there is a chance as slim as we might believe that he plays all three games this week so we'll, we'll see how it goes um anything about the the, the last update i have is zellweger ahl anything you want to touch on with the ducks roster the, the first games before we move on I, I want to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Did you... So, I saw people saying, if you were going to sit him in the back-to-back, why wouldn't you sit him for the away game? To me, and I think I saw a couple of people, I think I saw Jake Rudolph say the same thing, and if I'm mischaracterizing, I apologize. 
Uh, God knows he probably doesn't want to agree with me. Um, but playing him against Arizona, who's not good, versus playing him against Boston, who's very good, makes all the sense in the world to me. Like, I, I don't under get the, I understand the idea that this is a ridiculous idea. Because to me, playing him in games where he has a very uh, obvious chance to excel means makes more sense. Like, if you're going to give him games off, dude, fuck, yeah. Take it off. Dude, don't, you don't need to play Boston. I don't need you going out there with Brandon Carlo and Brad Marchand. Like, I, I don't need you doing that. That is not a thing I'm asking of you this year. Go out there against fucking the Coyotes, who you have a much better chance to be an impactful player over the 23 fucking minutes you're going to play, apparently. Like, that makes all the sense in the world to me. Am I am I silly? Is that no? I I think I I could be wrong, but I believe you asked this article in the roundtable. I believe I answered. I think he's going to sit against Boston. It just made sense more to play him against the a weaker opposition in a sense, mm-hmm. um, even if it being a road game. To just don't get, do that. Don't yeah. couch it. It's not. It's yes, not an absurd or insulting thing to say <laughs> that Arizona is not Boston. Don't fucking don't yeah. couch it on me. No, so yeah, I, 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 that's. I just felt it made more sense to play him against the weaker opposition, and and not have to have him go against this early against Boston. That could change. I'm fine with that changing later on in the season. I, I, t- I am for sure. If they want to sit him against, you know, the weaker opponent and play him against a t- tougher opponent, twenty, twenty five games in because they feel he can handle that. That's fine. This was game three for the kid, or game two, after an NHL debut. I'm fine with that game two being against Arizona, so he can build on that development rather than say, "Let's throw you in against a team that's four and zero right now, um, and and see how you do." You know, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so I'm 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 fine with it. I, I again, um, I I get what people are saying. Let's have him play at home. You want to see? I, I feel like a lot of that is driven by the fact people just want to see him play, and they were mm-hmm. going to the game more than anything, but. Uh, you have to understand, like there, there is a lot of benefit to playing him against the the weaker opponent and letting him go and improve on what was probably a stressful and tough NHL debut for him. Despite obviously scoring uh, in that game, it's it's a stressful moment and and a lot of emotion, a lot of excitement. So it's better to follow that up, I think, with a, a little bit of an easier game and one that you know he has a better chance to succeed in, rather than to throw him in against Boston and and expect. I don't want to say expect a dud, but have a tougher chance to perform right after his NHL debut, coming off a high like that. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, okay, brag about your brag about your boy, Olin. Yeah. Um, Apparently he's so, fucking Eric Carlson down there right now or some I shit. Know, man. I know. He, uh, <laughs> my, fa- my favorite part, and you, you pointed this out, <laughs> is the picture he took after he scored <laughs> his, his first AHL goal the other night. He just, he looks like a guy, and I don't want to say, because he probably is happy to be down there, but he just looks like a guy that, that's like, this is not where I want to be. <laughs> right? This is like, not the first goal picture I want to be taking. Right yeah, now. yeah, so 100%. I, I, for sure, I'm sure he was happy, and it's just the timing of the picture and everything, but it, it's just funny to see that. But his start has been great, and it's it's great to see. I mean, the fact that you got Minchikov and Lacombe, Starting the way they did um, in the NHL, you got Drysdale who started well and is going to come back from injuries. Luno has looked Im- Im- impressive, albeit maybe not NHL ready. He's looked good in the games that he's played. Then you got Zellweger in three games. Oh, he's put up a goal, three assists, and thirteen shots on goal. So he's just continued to do exactly what he did well at the junior level, and that was just drive play offensively and shoot the mm-hmm. puck. Like he is a rush defenseman in every definition of the word. He gets up ice and he shoots the puck. Uh, he, he just that that's what he loves to do and he's excelled at it in three games at the pro level already he's looked like one of the girls best defense um i still think and i wrote this again in that you know, everybody's got to go check out the roundtable article that we did oh no we yeah, i think this would have been no this would have been the, the prospect preview i did i think mm-hmm. for the defenseman that i i don't expect to see him up anytime soon um, because, no, that was because I asked in the thing, yes, it was around who's going to be yes. next. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't expect to see him up sooner rather than later. Later, even if the production continues, even if he it ends up being a you know fifteen to twenty point guy in fifteen to twenty games, like a point per game player at the AHL level through that that stretch of games, 
uh, because Minchikovas look good and because Lacombs look good. And you've got Fowler and Drysdale and Labushkin and Gudis, and then you've got your spare guys in Vakanine and the guys like that. Um, I think Luno gets sent back down to junior, but then Zellweger gets some time here to produce over a longer period of time at the AHL level. And then I think around that 20 game mark um, in the AHL, if there is guys struggling or if there's injuries, which there are likely going to be, there always are. I think that's when he gets his chance, but this is, you know, as close to as good a start you could hope for from Olin Zellweger is defensively. He's looked good. The speed's been there. There's been no issue just like there was no issue with junior for him with his size. Uh, He's been able to defend well. And then the offense, has immediately transitioned and that's always the one of the concerning things too is that it's not you know he's playing against you know junior opposition where he's just way better than them offensively that it, it's not going to translate to the next level um it's three games small sample size but he he's looked exceptional so i wanted to point that out and and you know let's give some credit to jacob uh, perot as well two goals and an assist in his first three games goals in uh each of the first two games for him He's looked good, and, and I, he's one guy I really hope gets it together because there was a lot of excitement when he was drafted for the Ducks. He's been you know, elevated. I think he's playing on, on the second line or the top line. He's playing with um, Pavel Regenda, who has been great. He gets, Pat Regenda has four goals in four games for, for the Golston. Including the shorty. To, yeah, for 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 the girls to open the season, so um, good good stuff for them. I point out those two guys in Zellweger and Perot um, that if they continue to play well, those are definitely guys we could see for more than a handful of games this year. So I'm gonna choose to advance my own personal agenda here. Mm-hmm. Uh, how good does Zellweger have to be this year for us to start talking about trading Cam Fowler? Man. Because. Here's the thing. Minchikov Zellweger looks really Lacombe. good right now. Minchikov <laughs> looks really good right now. And I don't think you can in good conscience send Lacombe down. Mm-hmm. You also are not at a position where you can afford to trade either of those guys away. No, well, and, and Gudis and, and, um, and Drysdale are going nowhere. So then it's... Correct. It's so now you've got Lubushkin, who I imagine... Now look, the way he's played... With Minchikov so far, if yeah, they wanted to talk to him about an extension at some point, I, that, I'm open to the conversation. But you also have to be careful. You know, again, one of the reasons that me and you were not down on the Lubushkin trade is because he was an expiring contract. It didn't seem like he was going to get a you know a contract right away, so it didn't affect the long term viability of adding that young talent into this top six. Yeah, or into, into this NHL defense, I should say that way. <clears throat> that being said. I think it's safe to say that Gudis, Lacombe, Minchikov, and Drysdale are NHLers right now. Mm-hmm. Full stop. Labushkin has looked very strong next to Minchikov. Questions about how much of that could be Minchikov we can have at the end of the year when he's you know accepting the Calder Trophy. Um, and then it just becomes about if... We want to keep him because we think Lenoz maybe needs another year. Warren isn't ready. Maybe Tyson Hines isn't ready full time, something like that. What roster spots do we have to give Zellweger, who could theoretically look more than deserving of coming up? Yeah. Eddie, it's, <laughs> Eddie, is my nightmare over? It, it could be. There's, there's a scenario where it makes it easier to move him. Still, moving him as a whole is very difficult because because of the stipulations on his on his contract. Yeah, he's got a fourteen deal. trade list. Yeah, he's got a big um, contract. He's got two years left after this one. Like, so it's, I, it's it's a hard yeah. thing to achieve. Taking that out of the equation, though, and just looking at like, could he be available for trade because they have options that they can move forward with? I think that's very very possible because I think if Lacombe and Minchikov can prove they can stay here and, and be consistent and play the way they have and stay for the entire season, you look at a potential pairings of Lacombe, Drysdale, Minchikov, uh, Labushkin, uh, Zellweger, Gudis. Like that's it's not mm-hmm. bad. And if Lacombe and Minchikov are playing the way they are, where Minchikov is kind of the the two way threat with a you know the the offensive upside Lacombe is is kind of the the. I don't want to call him a shutdown defenseman, but you know the the more defensive two way approach the way he's played, I think pairs well with Drysdale, and then you add Olin Zellweger, who's going to be that kind of rush defenseman with a stay at home guy like Gudis. You can see where it works. I think 
for that to happen, Zellweger has to continue to play this way at the age yes, level. Yes, 100%. Be almost a point per game player, if not above that. When he gets the call up, has to make an immediate impact and mm-hmm. be you know, a guy who's contributing five on five offensively. He's putting up points. He's going to work his way into power play time immediately. He's going to have to have the same impact that Minchikov and, and Lacombe have had. But I think with Zellweger, there's going to have to be more offense there, more point production, because he's a great defenseman on the defensive game side of things, but you're not going to notice it as much because he is a smaller guy where I think you're going to notice more of the offense. So he's going to have to put up the numbers, I think, to be able to push up, push out a guy like Cam Fowler, right? So there mm-hmm. is, it's it's within the realm of possibility. Like it, hey. it is, it is more than a 0.1% chance. Like there, there is a world where Zellweger is definitely talented enough that he could push for a roster spot in the next 15, 20 games and stick around and make it a really tough decision for the Ducks and saying, what do we do with these guys? Like, we have mm-hmm. seven guys who can play. And we really like how this one guy in Labushkin looks with Michikov. We like how Lacombe's playing. We like, obviously, Drysdale. And we've got Gudas. And we, we like Cam. But, like, what do we do here, right? Like, it, it, it can definitely be made interesting very quickly. And it does all hinge specifically on Zellweger, I think. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say any of the other guys... Luno could have mm-hmm. made things interesting if he started exceptional, but I think with his ease of being sent back down to junior, um, mm-hmm. that's where he goes. But Zellweger is really the guy that makes this interesting if he steps into the lineup and, and presses right off the bat. And Yeah, and I, I want to say this much. I think it would take an injury to one of the younger guys to get Zellweger up. Zellweger would have to press it. And then maybe we're having a conversation around the deadline of the team looking to add Kent Fowler. But in my mind, this is much more of a season is over. We're going into the draft. We're going into free agency. And it's, you know, we have a legitimate opportunity here uh, to add or to move a veteran player, add some good young talent, and continue to develop this core. And so that's the question we get into. I also want to say, Cam Fowler has looked reinvigorated this year. Yes. He's been a bit more aggressive um, in the defensive zone, which is nice to see. That being said, he has made multiple mistakes multiple times that has led to Brian Hayward deciding it's the younger player's fault as far as McTavish and Zegers is concerned, and I'm irate about this. It's absolutely ridiculous that Brian Hayward is going on television. Like, everybody was mad, and again, obviously I'm biased here. Everybody was mad that Brian Hayward was like, "Mm, we might have to see about breaking up this top line, and I was like, yeah, he's right. But then two games so far, Cam Fowler has made a dumbass mistake, and Zegers gets burned, and McTavish gets burned, and he's like, oh, those young, those young whippersnappers can't make those mistakes. He's like, bro, did you not see the 10-year veteran who's about to play 900 games just completely fuck this up? Anyways, he's played really well this year as far as looking engaged, looking physical. Um, you know, I... He's finally off of the top power play unit, thank God. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but I, I'm not trying to be a total dickhead to Ken Fowler here. Um, I, I, I want to point one thing out here: the Detroit Red Wings are five one and zero. They Ooh, have, baby. are Ooh, currently baby. employing Jake Wallman, Ben Sherrod, yeah, but Ben Sherrod's going to win the Norris this year, so they're not taking Cam. You know who I, I'm telling you, bro? You know the trade I want is I want Cam Fowler for TJ Oshie. It's not bad, but I mean, Cam Fowler with Moritz Cider is. Uh, mm. Yeah, that's what Moritz Cider yeah. needs to carry around Cam Fowler. <laughs> uh, but it would be cool for Cam to go home. It would be that's very just cool, one of the places I could see uh, him wanting to go um, yeah. on the four team list. Uh, especially is, after like seeing uh, how how great DeBrinket looks early to be back yeah. home, I, yeah. I could see them being like, "Oh, let's bring another." You know, yeah. Yeah, now we've got the, the Michigan. Minnesota. They want the hmm? Michigan boys there. They're the new Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. They want exactly. all the Michigan guys. They got Larkin. They've got Dabrinkit. Mm-hmm. Quinn Hughes is eventually going to go over there. I don't even know if Quinn Hughes is from Michigan, other than the fact that he played for Michigan. But no, aren't uh, they all? Aren't all those boys from Jersey or from New York? Maybe the Hughes family, I think, is from New York. I just I always I'm assume the shit. guys who come from Michigan. <laughs> yeah, that's <fair. laughs> from Michigan, which is completely wrong level of thinking, but that's what I'm going to go with. Um, because usually the guys who play for Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, are from Minnesota more right. often than not. 
and the guys who go, are from Boston College are usually from the, the Boston area. So I just uh, assumed Michigan would be in the same boat. Um, okay, questions? You want to get to fan questions? Let's go. Listener questions. Fan questions on super douchey. Well, the first one makes sense because it's from Dave, so it is a fan question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an Eddie fan question. Let's yeah. be very clear. Yeah. Um, he asked just a very generic question. Who do you think wins the Stanley Cup this year? Six games into the season. <laughs> Who do you got? So, I am Did you torn. have a pick before the season? Or no? Uh, I hadn't thought a ton, ton about it. Um, but I will say... I, I am inclined to end up with Dallas here. Yeah, so that was my pick before the season. And I like I've... Dallas, man. I like what they're doing. I, I think... Uh, now, that being said, as soon as they make the dumbass decision to sign Patrick Kane, that all goes away. Because here's... <laughs> they here's will, look, they're going to do I, it, too. <laughs> I don't like Patrick Kane, and that's whatever. Yeah. But more than anything, you've already, you've got Logan Stankovic mm. in the minors right now, who is just a tiny little gold factory. Why wouldn't you bring him up instead of signing the decaying corpse of a once great hockey player? Like, like Stankoven Patrick Kane also, by the way, has so four bad. goals and seven points in five games. In the oh, he's so right good. Now, so. Logan Stankovic is so good. He has, yeah. I want him to succeed so bad. He's going to be up in soon. He's, he's forward all in Zellweger. He went yeah. later in the draft than he should have because he's a small guy. Yeah, they played together last year. And uh, Logan, Logan Stankover and Olin Zellweger led the WHL playoffs in points last year. So, Like, I, man, I would much rather bring him up, move him to the wing, because you don't need to play him at center. You're oh, he's a winger. He's 100% a winger, yeah. You think you think he's a full-time winger at the NHL level? Uh, yeah, he has to be. He's too small. I, I, listen, yeah, he's too small. I don't. I don't like to get into that conversation, but he is too small. He's not going to be a center uh, yeah. at the NHL level. He and I, like I, I think he even played wing a lot of times for um, Kamloops last year. But he is a he is a, he has to be a wing. He's five foot eight. So I just can't. Yeah. I can't yeah. see. I mean, uh, listen, maybe. Yeah, Braden Point. He's yeah. four and a half feet tall, but I think Braden Point's five nine. Braden's so five ten, I think. So he's he's right he at that blind. like. He might be right at that threshold. He's yeah, absolutely yeah. <laughs> not a five ten player. <laughs> but you know, Cole regardless, did it five um, eight, so he's not that either. Yeah, I mean, D- Dallas is my pick too. I really like Wyatt Johnson. He started mm-hmm. really well there. Um, add Logan Stank over to that mix. Um, you know, obviously Ben Sagan, Robertson, Hintz, Heiskanen is is. They also over. got the good Predator cast off. They got Duchesne, and I yeah. like the opportunity for Duchesne to add some more. Uh, Offensive creativity to that roster. I, yeah. I think he's like I, I again. I'm super down on Ryan Johansson. Like I mm-hmm. do not like him, and no. I don't think he's very good, especially at this stage in his career. Um, but Matt Duchesne, I see as someone who still got pretty good foot speed, and and could absolutely be a really nice addition to that team to mix yeah. in with some of those younger players, man. I really he's got a lot of depth too. They've got Craig uh-huh. Smith on the fourth line. They've got Dadanov. They've got Mason Marchment still there. Radic Fax is a really good third line center. Yeah. Like yeah. they might look he's to the fourth line contract. center right now. Cause they've got uh, Hintz, Duchesne, Johnston, Faxa, but, uh, Oh, okay. But either way, like he, when he, mm-hmm. he is a good third line center who's playing on the fourth line right now. And he's playing right. with yeah. Craig Smith and Ty Delandria, which is a, a pretty good fourth line to be yeah. rolling out there. So. 100%. And this is for me too. This is Jake Robert, uh, Jake Ottinger, Vesna season this year. Like he is that good. Like he is he's a really he's good been, player. He's been playing out of his mind too. Who um, do you think would be the first to win a heart between him and Heiskanen? Or not a heart? Uh, sorry, who would be the first to win their respective award? Like, do you think Ottinger wins the Vesna before Heiskanen mm-hmm. wins a Norris? Yes, and and it's it's not that I don't believe. I just think the competi- there's more competition there for uh, for Heiskanen to win the uh, the, vet, mm-hmm. the for Heiskanen to win the Norris. There's a lot more competition from from a, a lot of different guys who are at the top end of their game. Where I think Jake Ottinger goaltender position is a little bit more volatile, and I think if he he's the guy there, like he is the guy, he's gonna play sixty plus games for this team because Scott Wedgwood is the backup. Uh, if they mm-hmm. are good, 
he could be a 40 win goaltender and just run away with the award right like i i, th I think he's that good and you think right now he's going up against you know, boston as good as they are they're going to split all year so it's hard to put all mark or swayman in that conversation um i don't think georgiev is is going to be a guy who would compete for it despite the Avs being 5-0-0. Vegas is also going to split goaltending with Hill and Thompson, in, right, the, in, in there. Uh, Detroit's not going to stick around for the entire year. So I think if you just look at those top teams right now, like Ottinger seems like the guy who will be the bona fide starter for his team and a, the t on a team that has a chance to be one of the best in the NHL. So I mm -hmm. think he has the, the best chance to do it. But Heiskin is right behind him as, in Vesna. Mm -hmm. he, I can see him finishing top three easily. It's just it would be a very, very close top three when you think obviously Makar is going to be there. Um, you know, There's going to be a lot of other guys that are going to be in that position. Dalene is going to be there Dalene. as well. And so yep. it's, it's a lot uh, a mm -hmm. lot of guys who can step up and, and com compete with Heiskin and for that award. Fox. Heiskin's going to have to put up 70 to 80 points. While also being one of the best, you know, defensive defensemen in the league, he's going to have to do something like that, which is possible. It's within the realm of possibility for him, and he's top power play there. But um, I, I give a slight edge to Ottinger. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I if uh, I would, you know, coming into the season, I would say before, over either of those, I would expect Robertson to win a heart. But I think your point about Ottinger and the volatility of the goaltending position it yeah. makes a lot of sense. This is a team too that that's. Started three zero and one, and Jason Robinson hasn't even started getting going yet. So right. it's going to be a whole different story when he he starts to show what he showed last year. Um, okay, Chad's got a, a he's a real MVP here because he's got a bunch of questions. Uh, his first one is: Did Vakanainen show enough to you holding down Boston to be a piece of the blue line this season, barring injury? Yeah, I think he's earned the opportunity to be first in. Right, yeah, I like think, I, I think he's I think a piece. Me, he's a seventh defenseman. Like he's I think that's exactly right. There. Like yeah. I think, again, I think we both kind of said earlier that we think at some point Lenoir will get sent back down, and I think at that point he is the definitive seventh guy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I, good for him, man. I, like I said, I, I was pretty vocal about it last time we talked. Like I didn't think he should have been at the NHL level just because uh, he's just had so much. Uh, bad luck injury wise that I didn't think he would be able to find the consistency and I, I, I hope I'm wrong I would love to see him play really well so yeah no I'm the same boat there I think right now he he's the seventh guy for sure uh, Luno gets sent back down to junior at some point Drysdale comes back in and he'll swap in pretty regularly for uh, any injuries that come up he'll be the first guy in to do that so I, I think he deserves that I think he's shown again small sample size he played like what 14 minutes um, at 14 minutes at 5 on 5 in that game against Boston, so it's, it's it's not enough. But I think of the other guys available, he, no matter what, I think he's the seventh guy right now. But again, we've talked about Zellweger and other guys who could take steps forward that that could throw a wrench in that of him being uh, his you know so, solidity as a a roster guy and the seventh guy could be uh, it could start dissolving pretty quickly uh, if other guys step up. Uh, second question from Chad: Where does Kalorn go for the power play? And do you expect the Nasty Brothers, Strom and Vitrano, to take a step down with Kalorn potentially breaking up that line? First of all, uh, motion to only refer to those two as the Nasty Brothers. Now, I don't even know where that possibly comes. Yeah, I don't know where that, that comes from. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but I love it. Uh, I would put him in the bumper role and move Strom to the second power play unit. Mm -hmm. um, and go more of a traditional uh, high tip goalie screen expectation from him, uh, with Minchikov being able to get pucks on net from from uh, from the blue line, and then having the ability to, uh, you know, we've seen Terry Zegers and Minchikov really do a good job about shifting on the power play, the point of attack, and, and moving it with some intentionality, and not just doing standard umbrella passing right more of aggressively you know making moves to to create shots and i think putting kalorn into that to to slide around and, and screen the goalie and get some high tips could be a really exciting opportunity and also provides a very interesting potential to uh have a stronger power play too because you don't need to just play your five best players on the first power play unit uh even though uh a lot of people including connor who i Ridiculous, man. Uh, no. Um, I was giving crap about that the other day. 
but like I don't I, I'm just again I'm not a fan of the all the eggs in one basket thing and I think with as much offensive talent as there it looks like there could possibly be here why you wouldn't put together two strong units uh, is beyond me so that's just one of those things for me and I think Kalorn one has an opportunity to be very effective in that kind of high screen role mm. uh, but also opens up some opportunities to move some other guys onto the second power play unit and have a good second unit. What about you? Sorry, I took way too long. No, no, you're good. No, I, I, I think um, he for sure slots in on one of the units, obviously. Um, I, I like the potential for him slotting on, on power play one because it allows you to, to split things up and have some of your top guys go on to the second unit. Like, listen, they're, they're, when he does come back, there are going to be two talented units because you... That means one of McTavish, Carlson, Terry, Zegers are going to be on that second unit, if not two of them, right? Mm-hmm. With Kalorn coming in, that means somebody checks out. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the next question ties into this as well. So you might know if it's from Chad where he mentions, does Mason, <laughs> does Mason McTavish deserve a spot on power play one? And I think this ties into that. And a lot of it depends on do they want Trevor Zegers or think he can still be the trigger man on power play one because Mason McTavish has success has had success there. I think there there is in a world when everybody's healthy where Mason McTavish and Trevor Zegers are on the same power play unit because I think they want those two guys to be the main trigger man on the power play. So one of them is going to be on power play one and one of them is going to be on power play two. And I think obviously Zegers has the slight edge at this point in time, but that could change. So I think at some point. If he continues to not have success from that position, it will be McTavish who goes into that role to see if they can change things. I don't think Zegers necessarily gets bumped down to power play two at this point, but when Kalorn comes back, that's where I, I think that could be a possibility. So um, I, I do like him being kind of the high tip guy, the guy that kind of floats around the ice. I think that makes sense for him. Mitch is going to be working the point. Terry's going to be working the boards. Uh, and then you have your kind of choice of, of the next guy you want to kind of you know, who, the, the next player you want to rotate in there or if you want another defenseman or if you want to get behind the net type guy. So they'll, they'll you know, be able to decide who they want for that type of role. But for sure, uh, Kalorn jumps in, into one of these power play units and makes a difference. I'm excited to, to see him come back and, and mm-hmm. I was, you know, see what he can do to this lineup because it's, we've already talked about it uh, on the show today, but the uh, the lineup decisions that have to get made when he comes back don't just affect you know lines one two and three it affects both power play units as well so it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see how they adapt to that and and where uh, where these guys go the next question was from Ducks Brazil is when does Cologne come back I think his prognosis was what four to six weeks and that yeah. was a couple weeks ago so late November early December probably I would imagine and that's just speculating based yeah, off the timeline yeah, I think right. so yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. Hopefully, again, sooner rather than later. Um, Chris says, steak or chicken? Uh, so I was thinking about this, and as much as I want this to be a situational answer, right, where it's like, oh, like sometimes chicken is better than steak, and which can be true. I'm not saying but it's not. This is this is this has to be a steak and a ch- like a, a chicken on its own. Whether it's like so, oh, so leg. that's what we're so like, like oh, is it, because uh, cool. you can't you can't have it like steak or chicken because there are scenarios where one is better than the other. Okay, like, so let's do it this I, way. Let's do it this way. For a taco, steak or chicken? A chicken. For a taco? Yeah. I go steak. What about for a sandwich? still go chicken i think i go chicken too I, that's yeah i'm see, not i, I'm not I like love steak i love steak but like see, now, what about, has, see i see, the, the steak tacos i'm thinking of too are probably not the same as what you can probably get where you are right like i'm thinking it, it's tougher than mm, chicken where i'm not looking you to poor get that. canadian I bastard know, man, i know i don't have i don't have the great option for it's okay tacos. i didn't I, I don't know anywhere around here i can go get poutine and god gravy is so good just gravy rocks I think it, yes. If you're if you're talking in most other scenarios that I'm like, if it's a taco or something, I'm putting it in. I think more more probably eight out of ten times I'm picking chicken. It just makes sense in more things than others. Uh, but a straight steak or a piece of chicken, it's steak. And the only yes. time chicken gets anywhere close if it's if it's a fried chicken. 
then it then it starts to dip into that. Territory. Here's what I will like say. a fried chicken sandwich or something like that. Then it Look, dips into that territory. Uh, dude, I I just had fried chicken the other night. I had fried chicken for breakfast the other day in solidarity yeah. with that guy Lou. Uh, let me say this. You know what's surprisingly wonderful is smoked chicken thigh. Like mm-hmm. if you can get like a dry rub and a chicken thigh, like bone skin, the whole thing. Oh my god, bro, that's like one of the best. Oh, that's dry rub smoked bone in skin on chicken thigh is incredible so yeah this was the question that sparked the most debate of all of them <laughs> it, was, it was no that was the <laughs> one oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> um all right justin cole said favorite player so far and least favorite player to start the season uh favorite player is radko fucking Gudis, dude i don't he's done exactly what i wanted him to do i get that he's taken some penalties but the whole team is taking penalties so i'm not going to single him out for that uh, I, I've he's been exactly man. He's been awesome. I've loved him so much. He's been he's yeah. been great. I he's exactly exactly what I was hoping he would do for this team. He's done so far. Yeah, I got for me. I gotta go with my boy Pablo Minchikov. Yeah, he's been of course you my do. Favorite of course player you do. So far, but it's so hard. It's and and this the, the the least favorite player is is even harder to choose. Like I don't really have anybody that I'm nitpicking with. Like other than. Just maybe some guys that I, I'm not as high on, like maybe, you know, Max don't Jones or Jacob Silverberg. Oh, sure. Like, yeah. like I, I don't know who – because, I'm, again, I'm not expecting much from Leeson and Carrick, and I think they've looked good. And you're going to, what, say Ross Johnston? Like, <laughs> like what, what are you – No, exactly. Dude, yeah. I want the, like, soccer FIFA heat map of Ross Johnston. I was watching him last <laughs> yeah. game, dude. He basically just plays three point line to three point line, straight yeah. up and down. It rocks. He's awesome. I love him. He's quick too. He surprised me how quick he moves. Yeah, he skates pretty well for a, a guy that big. And if you want to be mean, say that unskilled. But he's not a guy who would want to fight. Man, he no, was, my God, he he's fought so Liam O'Brien. He's young he was too. Like huge compared. <laughs> towered yeah, over him. It was not good for him but yeah it's it's hard to pick a least favorite player man i don't i don't i don't know that i have a least favorite honestly like again like i would say cam but that's just because i'm an asshole yeah yeah and i just have a personal vendetta and and it's more so just because like they haven't gone above our expectations for them like that's how i feel where i say it's least favorite you know again i said earlier he's played really well he's been more engaged physically than i've seen from him in years Mm -hmm. um you know Again, like his flaws are still there and all that stuff, but he has looked engaged. You can't, you know, you can't knock the guy. His effort, his passion is still clearly there. Like, I, again, I don't know. It, look, let me say it this way we'll save this question in 25 games. We will have a least favorite yeah, I'll have an for answer, you. 100%. Don't worry yeah. about that. We're yeah. some, I mean, for a lot of fans right now, is it Mason McTavish because he can't stay out of the box? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, but he's scoring goals, so then that, that helps ease the pain a little quickly. So funny. Maybe it's Adam Henrique for some people, just because he hasn't played that. But, big he's, been, but he's been fine. He's been exactly. What he's you been want fine. Adam he's been fine. That's it. But still, I feel like I feel like if you ask most people, it's probably it's Ross Johnson. Um, yeah, well, or a Silverberg or something like that. I think. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay. So, question from Hockey South: We might be one in four, but the systems improvement and personnel decisions under Verbeek slash Cronin are awesome. Six, I don't know if this is a question. No, this is not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Success will come four through five games with two being empty netters against top teams is awesome. Um, and then he had a, he had a question underneath that. He said, "Is it time to talk about Terry on the PK? A talent upgrade seems like the answer no. for a struggling penalty." No, game. no, you don't need to do that. No. Absolutely not. You have an abundance of guys who can play the penalty kill. We've seen Vitrano, Carrick, Leeson, Silverberg, Gru, and I think Henrique. There is no reason for Zegris, McTavish, Terry, or Carlson to go anywhere near the fucking penalty kill at all. Mm. No need. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, it's not a great penalty kill so far, but it's not bad. It's ranked 21st at 74%. Like, I don't think adding Troy Terry to that penalty I don't need those guys wasting kill. energy blocking no, shots. I no, don't no, need no. it. I, I don't think adding Troy Terry to the penalty kill honestly makes it a, a all of a sudden go from a 21st ranked unit to a 50, top 15 ranked unit. I don't – he's gr- a great player. I just uh, – I think all adding Troy Terry to the penalty kill unit does is maybe provide you a bit more of a shorthanded threat. But I'm not – really worried about that like i think bo grew and sam carrick and brett leeson have done a good job mm-hmm. on the penalty kill like i'm i'm not 
disappointed with what they've done despite the unit being ranked you know 21st in the league like they had they went up against some some really good teams against vegas and and boston and dallas like carolina like those are tough teams to go against teams mm-hmm. that have had top power play units over the last couple of years so i think that we see that even out over the next 20 games but i even if it doesn't i don't see the answer being troy terry on the penalty kill for the reasons you said you want this guy at five on five on the power play playing 19 20 minutes night you don't want him playing you know especially the way the Ducks have been taking penalties. You don't want him playing six, seven minutes on the penalty kill, and then you don't get to use him for the rest of the game where you need him, right? So this you is a team that's not going to score a lot of goals. fucking ankle blocking yeah. shots. Well, yeah, that, and like, this is a team that's not going to score a lot of goals as is. You don't need your one of your best goal right. scorers, your best players, playing six minutes a night on the penalty kill where it means you only get to pay, play him 12 minutes a night for the rest of the night at five on five or on the power play because you're not playing him 30 minutes a night. And that's what the realm you would try and have to get to to keep his minutes the same and add, you know, three to four minutes of penalty kill time a night. So it's just, yeah. It's not feasible. I get the thought behind it for sure because he is one of the Ducks' best defensive forwards um, statistically. But, like, for when you look at the big picture, we need this guy in other areas of the ice. We right. Just, and, we can't and, have him there. And, yeah, and like you said, like, if you wanted to maybe say, like, he, he, he increases a shorthanded threat, I would say for me, whatever, I would say you – Make you generate more chances off of speed than skill on the penalty kill, and there is already, which is not to say he's slow, but there are already other players who are pretty fast and pretty good at getting a vice who you can allow to continue to block shots and penalty kill and save Troy Terry from when he can have the biggest impact on the game. Look, if it's game seven of the Western Conference Finals and you're down or you're or whatever, and you're like. All right, Trey, we need you to watch him kill a penalty. That's a completely different conversation. But I don't need him killing penalties in October. No. No. Uh, so. I, I completely get that. Um, last question. Who is the first goal called up from San Diego? Alex Daylock. He's such a cop, bro. <laughs> Alex. John Daylock. Gibson's getting traded. Let's go. Um, yeah, my answer is going to be the same along, like, kind of a cop-out answer. I, I was going to say uh, Andrew Agazino is going to be the first guy called up to just fill a roster spot. But um, if we're talking, like, maybe, like, exciting ones, I think Nestorenko and Regenda probably are, are near the top of the list of guys who could be called up because they've played games before. Um, I, I think when you know, what people are looking for from that question. Are we hoping we're going to say it's Goche, Perot, or Zellweger or mm-hmm. Um Those guys are all more production-based and multiple, almost like multiple injury. Like, I, it would have to be playing at an insane level and to justify bringing them up over Regenda or Nestorenko or Agazino. And it's not that those guys are better than Perot or better than Pastor or better than Goche. It just to, makes they're more sense. They're easier to put into the bottom six. Yeah, they're easier to bring up and play, like you said, yeah, in the bottom six where you can then elevate those other guys in the lineup in San Diego to get more minutes at a, at a higher position in the lineup. So I would say Zellweger maybe of those, that bunch of four there has a better shot because if he continues to play at this level and there are injuries to the blue line, there aren't a lot of options to call up. You're not going to call up Trevor Carrick, um, Colton White, Robert Hag are, are guys similar to Agazino that could get a call up before then. Um, but uh, Zellweger, I could see him above the others playing his way into uh, a call-up over the you know Perros and Pashovs and Goches. But I, I do think it is a rather unexciting one that happens first, and it's a Regenda or Agazino or Stalock or White or Hag or something like that. So oh, I should have I should have said Hag. What a coward. That would have been the funniest answer. Yeah, that would have been the good one. Um, Okay, that's it for the questions. The only other thing I got left here is we've got three games upcoming this week, so let's uh, give our thoughts and predictions on those games upcoming. They're going to lose all three. We got the... They're going to lose all three, three to one. We got the... no, oh, I, see, I, I had, a, I thought I had, a, I, I thought I could think. Of, I thought I could be witty and think of a, a like the non Bedard Bowl or something tomorrow, but no, I couldn't. I couldn't think of a good one. So it's it's Carlson versus Fantilli tomorrow, which is going to be a fun one. Fantilli just scored his first NHL goal uh, after Leo Carlson. It's true. I heard that. A lot of people are saying that that's true. Um, it'll be a fun game. Two young teams. 
two teams that are, are struggling a little bit right now, uh, but have some exciting pieces. No line A for Columbus, which is good for the Ducks. Uh, but still, a lot of weapons there. Our boy Kent Johnson, uh, Johnny Goodrow, of course, Adam Fantilli, uh, David Yurichek, good young defenseman. Wierenski's back for them. Um, this one is a little bit more up to speed for the Ducks. The way they've been playing, it should be a better chance of a win, right? It's not a Boston. Mm-hmm. It's not a Dallas. It's not a Vegas. This is a team that they should be beating. It's in Columbus. What do you think? What do you think? It's How do you think it's going to go? See, I wanted you to say they were going to lose because I wanted them to lose every game this year, but play it really well. <laughs> oh my God, don't, people are not going to like that. <laughs> Columbus is 3-2, and two, okay? So they are... Here's- they are okay. Here's look. I'll say they win. I think that they'll get the win here. I think we're going to see Carlson back in the lineup. I, I think it's going to be a good game. I think Anaheim's going to win. Here's the question I have for you: mm-hmm. Does Adam Fantilli try to fight Leo Carlson at some point in this game? No. You don't think so? No, there's no. You way. don't think he gets chippy with him or anything no. post scrum gets wild? Not a chance. I think he no. does. I think he's no. going to try to start some shit. No, I really uh... do. No, I think we see a, a Ross Johnson fight, but I don't think we see. Uh, you think you could? T- I mean, you got good Branson. Can you can you guess who the leading scorer is for the Blue, uh, Blue Jackets right now? Oh, is it Jack Rosovic? No. Is it? Let's see. Ooh. Okay, give me a second. Uh, is it Johnny Gaudreau? It can't be Johnny no. Gaudreau. No, he's got is... Johnny Gaudreau's got three assists in five games. Is it whichever Cole plays for them? Is Cole Sillinger? No, he's got one point. Mm-hmm. Or two points. So he got two. It's Boone Jenner. Jesus. Four goals and five points in five games. The Good second thing. guy you would have never got, Justin Danforth. Three goals and four points. My in favorite five player games. in the world. People don't know this yeah. about me. Averaging Lifelong 11 Justin minutes Danforth a night. Fan. Yeah, Provorov has four assists in five games. Goodrow's got three assists. Marchenko, the guy who was the Cy Young candidate, like 21 goals and three assists <laughs> last year, has three assists this year and no goals. So, uh, Wierenski's back. He's got three points in three games. So, it'll be a, it'll be a fun game. Fantilli's going to go out, bro. Assist. No, he's back. He was out, oh. and he, he played the last two last game for them, last uh, last two games for them since coming back. So, Wait, for real? Yeah. After the knee on knee? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's back. Wow, I didn't realize that. I thought he was going to be out for longer. I'll uh, I'll double check here, but I I'm. I hope you're certain, right. I hope you're right. Fairly certain he played their last game, uh, and he's back. Yeah, you know he is uh, good to go. He played the back to back against Calgary, Minnesota, the twentieth and twenty first. He scored a goal and an assist against Calgary, and got an assist against Minnesota. Both wins. For uh, Columbus, played 27 minutes against Minnesota, <laughs> so he is he is back and he's ready to go. So, um, and then we have a rematch against Boston on Thursday night in Boston. Boston still undefeated. Uh, I'm going to do a quick peek at their schedule here, but how do you think that? Uh, I say they lose the game before they play us, and then they bounce back and absolutely trounce Anaheim five one. So I'll say we beat Columbus. Four to two with an empty net goal, mm-hmm. and I'll say we lose ooh, five three. Actually, I'll go five three loss to Boston. So I don't think th- they're going to lose. Boston is going to roll into uh, Anaheim being six and zero oh because they're playing Chicago tomorrow in Chicago. So that's a little tough, but. Uh, I, I do think that one's going to be a loss. I, I just I, all I want is to see a game as competitive as last time. It's going to be harder. You're playing in Boston, but uh, I I expect a win from the Columbus game, and um, I expect a loss from Boston, just the way Boston has started. But as long as it's a competitive game, that's all I'm that's all I'm worried about. Um, the last game Saturday against the Philadelphia Flyers, the 3-1-1 one one Philadelphia Flyers, because Carter Hart is back. And Sean Kachuri is back, too. So Man, there might not be a better story in the league right now yeah. than Sean Kachuri. Got his first goal on a penalty shot in, what, 22 months, I think is what it was. I ended up yeah, four but points I, in five I, games to start the year. Sean Kachuri rocks. He's yeah. so awesome. Like, I, I am rooting for him so hard. Um, 
Travis Konechny is also a fucking stud. He's got five goals and seven points in five games, so that's... He's not going to be on that team much longer. Somebody's going to trade for him. And uh, Carter Hart, like we said, 929 save percentage, uh, three wins, one loss, and four starts. He has been great, but he started the season like this last year, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. But a uh, surprising start from Philly. It's yeah, in definitely. Philly. It's in Philly. So yeah, I'm going to say they win. I'm going to say Philly wins that one. Philly wins that one. So I'll go win against Columbus. Overtime loss. I'll say that'll be Anaheim's first overtime game. So 1-1-1 one, one, and one this week. One, one, and one. Yes, sir. Okay. I like In it. In that order as well. Perfect. I like it. All right. Well, it's going to do it for the show today. We did, man, I swear to God, I looked at this uh, clock for the show, and it was like an hour 30, and somehow we're at two hours and five minutes now. So Perfect. I want to say two things real quick. Yeah, yeah, First off, shout out to Travis Dermott for throwing the pride take on his stick that rocked. Uh, good for him. That's a stupid fucking rule, and yeah. I hope the league embarrasses itself trying to figure out how to get mad at him for breaking a rule. Uh, they should be embarrassed themselves. I don't too. think they expected anybody to break the rule, honestly. No, so now they're they, like, they, they, look, look, it's fucking hockey do. players. I, I can't yeah. say I blame them for thinking everyone's going to fall in line, but good on Travis Dermott. And it should be pointed out that a player with everything to lose, I think he's on a bare minimum contract. I think he might even be on a two-way contract. He's a veteran player, like. He has a lot more to lose here. And this reminds me of JT Brown, who was a depth player when he took his stuff, uh, when he took a stand. And, and it's always these guys farther down the lineup uh, that end up taking this kind of stand. And, and they have the most to lose. And it's good to see. Good for Travis Dermott. Uh, second thing, uh, real quick, just because I can, say happy birthday to my uncle, who just recently turned 50. Uh, and is the biggest Anaheim Ducks fan I know. He's the reason I'm an Anaheim Ducks fan. Uh, he's the reason I'm as big of a hockey fan as I am, frankly. Um, and, he, he, you know, he's the reason I'm ha- a half-decent person, uh, even to begin with. My uncle is one of the sweetest, kindest, most generous and genuine people I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Uh, he's one of my heroes, and I love him very much. And he just turned 50, and so I just wanted to say happy birthday to him, and I love him, and uh, I'm grateful for him, even though I'm kind of a shit nephew. So, What's your uncle's name? Uh, Jimmy. All right, happy birthday, Uncle Jimmy. So, thank you. I appreciate that, everybody. Uh, also, last little thing, I guess. Uh, follow us and I'm calling. We've been doing some decent stuff. We just had... Uh, Chad UCLA Maltese just dropped a really awesome piece. It's like 3,500 words or some man after my own heart uh, going through the uh, history of the Arizona Ducks feud and how it started with John Gibson uh, trying to Batista bomb uh, <laughs> Connor Garland and ended with tr- people getting mad that Trevor Zegras said something he never said about Troy Sketcher's uh, passed away father. Uh, so yeah, it rocked. It was a great piece. Um, like you said, you put up two really awesome pieces, uh, about the prospect pool, looking at the forwards and the defenseman and the goalie. We did a round table for Leo's debut. Um, we're going to have more stuff coming soon. We're trying to figure out, you know, a bunch of different stuff. Uh, but it's awesome. And we're, we're going to try to, you know, make sure we give you guys some stuff to read and you guys can have some fun. So, yeah, I should mention too, um, there's going to be changes with the podcast. Nothing that should affect the way you listen at all. Um, but we're, sh- we're likely moving away from Megaphone um, and a few other things. Well, I don't want to mention it all now because the show's still going on the platform. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we are likely moving away from um, a few things regarding the podcast. Um, name's going to be the same. Platform we're going to be on is going to be different, but that's more of just going to be the hosting platform. So, still going to be on Spotify, still going to be on YouTube, um, still going to be on Apple Podcasts. None of that's going to change. Uh, just like the landing destination page for our podcast might change. But we'll keep you guys updated um, on social media and as well. You know, once that actually does happen, we'll mention that on the show and, and what's going to happen. But again, like I said, likely no noticeable changes that you'll see um but just want to put that out there it goes along with with the whole um, us joining anaheim calling and doing a lot of work for them as well so i just wanted to to make sure that was out there just in case you guys did notice any changes over the next couple weeks um i don't think there will be any be any but like i said just want to make sure everybody's aware yep sounds good buddy 
All right. All right. Well, I think was it every team plays tomorrow? Is this just tomorrow the, the, the where they're yes. testing out yes, that that kind of NHL red zone type thing? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, lots of hope you lots guys fucking like John Butchergross. If not, shit out of luck. <laughs> I don't even get mm-hmm. access to it. I was super pumped when they announced it, but I don't even get to experience the, <laughs> the, whole, the, whole, the whole aspect of it. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm I'm just watching the Duck game tomorrow. But it's a good it's a good time start for me. I think it's like a six six thirty start. It's a three thirty start for you guys, which is insane for a Tuesday. Isn't yeah. it though? Isn't yeah. it though? Isn't <laughs> that's, it though? That's it's fucking stupid. Isn't it though? <laughs> it's, I, I saw it. six thirty and it. I was like. I, I might be, I must be on Pacific time right here, but uh, yeah, no, I couldn't believe that. The 3.30 start or whatever for, for you guys. So whoever can enjoy the game, enjoy the game. I know most of you are probably still going to be at work. I enjoy the time because that means it's a 6.30 start for me. So I'm going to be just wrapping up or just starting dinner at that point and be able to watch the game. So I'll enjoy it. And you guys can feel, I don't feel sorry for you guys because the majority of your games are at 7 o'clock your time and they're at 10 o'clock my time. So I'm usually up till 1 a.m. watching some of these games. So I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm going to enjoy watching a game at a normal time. Um, let's hope the Ducks win against Columbus. We've got two other games that are going to be tough games, like we mentioned, throughout the rest of the week. Uh, and let's hope and pray for three Leo Carlson games this week, even though it's not likely going to happen. I, I think we'll get three, but I think we'll that'll be followed up by two the next week. Anyways, we'll talk about that later. All right. All right. Bye, appreciate everybody. you guys coming out. Take care. We'll see you next time.